It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Jim Dalrymple's here from the Loop. He's just back from WWDC. Andy Anako from Boston Public Radio. And the creator of PCALC, an actual developer, James Thompson. We've got lots to talk about. Everything Apple announced yesterday and everything we're learning about the new Mac, the new iOS, the new uh, Mac OS, and the brand new Mac computer. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 664, recorded Tuesday, June 4th, 2019. I'm buying as many as I can afford. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Eero. Never think about Wi Fi again when you can have brilliant, hyper fast, super simple Wi Fi with Eero. Visit Eero.com slash MacBreak and get $100 off the Eero base unit, two Beacons package with one year of Eero Plus when you enter the code MacBreak at checkout. And by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Captera's free website at Captera.com slash MacBreak. And by Calm, the number one app to help reduce your stress, relax your mind, and help you sleep. Get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we cover the latest Apple news. And man, is there Apple news today. <laughs> Holy cow. That's Andy Anako, who fortunately has a thousand-page Google Doc with everything Apple announced <laughs> yesterday. Hi, Andy. Yeah, that's it's. this was not one of those WWDCs where it's like, oh, I know what they're talking about. Oh, I recognize that acronym. Oh, I know what the ramifications of that are. It's like, as I was watching it, it was like, ask Tony about this. Ask Julia about yeah, that. Yeah. See if Bob has an opinion on, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, we do have a good expert in studio, or not in studio, but in the, in the Skype with us, uh, all the way from Glasgow, Scotland. James Thompson is here. Mr. Pink uh Cow. Pleasure to be back. So uh, I'm feeling somewhat overwhelmed. Uh, I was up till four in the morning last night getting things going with the new stuff. So Wow. Uh, so I'm, I guess the first thing I should ask you, when we talked to you a couple of weeks ago, you were a little concerned. You'd heard the rumor that Apple was going to put a calculator on the Apple Watch. Maybe <laughs> uh, maybe Calc was Sherlocked. I don't think so. <laughs> well, I mean, I... I, I there was that moment where they showed it and they said, oh, and it's got a tip calculator too. And everybody cheered. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, I did that years ago. Yeah, but can they do it in hex? <laughs> mm, well, <laughs> it, it, it's the, uh, I mean, these things happen. I, I don't I don't think Apple particularly went after me. No. But uh, it was just... Uh, uh, it's not always the great greatest start to a keynote when you get that little <laughs> dagger in the heart. <laughs> and, and it is true. This is a Mashable article. Apple fans lose their stuff for an Apple Watch tip calculator. There was a rather loud cheer. When it <laughs> yeah, said, there was. And I, 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 I was sort of, why are you cheering for that? It's like. But, that's the simplest you know. thing ever. But hey, yeah. okay, you know. And think and think about how all the other like system engineers at Apple who had like they yeah. barely made their deadlines on a project that yeah. revolutionizes like oh my god a remote monitor that's wireless it took us three years to get this right and you're applauding for a tip, tip calculator? calculator let alone uh, there was more time spent on dark mode than the entire Apple TV ecosystem <laughs> eh, that's kind of appropriate <laughs> yeah yeah if that's probably the only company that really got Sherlocked was duet display because Apple is going to build that into the next version of Mac OS the ability to use your iPad as a second display I've used duet for years I really like duet uh, they still have a market because it works on Windows as well as on uh, Mac OS but yeah, there was the Luna display people as well who've got the little hardware dongle yeah, thing. I have a uh, Luna too. Luna's different though because you don't have to be sitting next to yeah, the Mac. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so it's like almost a, a remote desktop for a, a Mac. That's the thing with all these Sherlock's. The, um, the stuff that Apple puts in is generally not as deep uh, as these products. You know, it does, does the basics. Um, so... There's always there's always a market, and I've 
competed with Apple built-in stuff for 20 plus years. So uh, I'm not worried. As a developer, uh, let's get your, your take. I mean, there was a lot in that keynote. It was two hours, 15 minutes. We covered it. In fact, you can go to twit.tv slash specials if you'd like to watch uh, Megan and my commentary over the uh, keynote. But uh, we're not developers, so I'm curious what James Thompson thinks. Um, it was a bit of a roller coaster, really. There was so many technologies. Like the the thing that everybody was expecting was Marzipan, which is now Project Catalyst, which sounds like some evil master plan rather than. And <laughs> uh, I don't get why they renamed it because it's not like they're going to show the name Project Catalyst to anybody you. else. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Catalyst is on Catalina, so maybe that. Yeah, was... I figured it was a double cat yeah. uh, reference. Yeah. So everybody was expecting that, and the AppKit developers were all getting a bit twitchy because they were thinking, "Oh, is you know UIKit going to come along and uh, effectively Sherlock us?" And as it turns out, everybody gets Sherlock because there's this Swift UI framework, which is clearly the future. And how far away that future is is a good question. Yeah, but, I am not a I am not a Swift developer, but when I saw Swift UI, I thought, "Wow, this is mm. going to be a revolution in software design." Xcode's always had that designer, which allows you to design a UI and then hook up code to go with it. But this uh, this has some features that are pretty sweet, not unique to Apple. I think React Native does a lot of this. There's the idea that you can have code running and modify it as it's running and see the result in an emulator or even on the phone directly. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks powerful. Um, I think, you know, there's this little voice in the back of my head that remembers Apple from the 90s yeah. who would roll out new <laughs> things each year. Uh, you know, how many people jumped to support OpenDoc? I'm not comparing this to OpenDoc. Oh, God, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, there's just that little bit of caution that I have, especially because all my code is, you know, it's 99 or 95% Objective-C UI kit or whatever like that. So... You know, this is the future, and uh, rightly so, I shall fear it. But uh, <laughs> as any prudent man would, I have to say, but, this feels like the death knell for Objective C. Um, yeah, I mean, I think things take a long time to die. I mean, yeah. carbon is only just about to be killed off this year, so carbon, you know, it's had nineteen years, um, and then all the years before that. I think Apple's APIs tend to hang around for a long time. Uh, most of the system is written in Objective C and things like that. Yeah, they can't you, you, sort of switch yeah. that stuff all off the APIs, overnight. All the APIs still begin with NS for next steps. So. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so plus, a, uh, plus, I'm, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I was just going to say. So I, I, I think this is the future, and this is probably something, you know, maybe in the five to ten year range. Um, I mean, I could also see, you know, if they do uh, the AR glasses or something like that, they could say, well, the only interface for this new platform is Swift UI. Yeah. Something, something along those lines could easily happen. Earlier today, uh, we were talking to Paul Goodman. Of course, he is uh, day one, the journal, and he is a true cross platform Apple uh, app. They are Macintosh, they are iOS, and they even do Watch OS. And I would imagine for somebody who wants to be fully cross-platform, the ability to use uh, Swift UI and develop for TV, watch, phone, <laughs> iPad, and and Mac all at the same time is kind of it's got to be appealing. I mean, you must be looking at that with some interest. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think in the short term, I can see me doing the uh, Project Catalyst stuff um, and. Then in the longer term, looking at Swift UI. Right. But what I have heard is that you can mix and match Swift UI oh. and UI Kit and everything. Wow. So you can have like a UI Kit app that has a Swift UI view in it. And then inside that view, you could have another um, UI Kit thing. So you can kind of uh, embed one within the other. Um, so you know, you can start adopting these things slowly. Like if I added a new view, I could just do that in Swift UI. It's not like you have to start the entire app over again or something. Um, 
Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes in the longer term. I, I, I'm. It looks very interesting. I also think for a lot of um, new developers and maybe even amateur or hobbyist developers, this might be really. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you're starting something from scratch, you know, it's yeah, definitely yeah. still. A, I mean, I'd already say you know use Swift if you're starting oh, yeah. from scratch and learn that. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm not sure at what point you'll be able to deploy the Swift UI apps if that's coming uh, soon. I expect it is. But I, I, with all this stuff, I, I'm somebody who's sort of, I like to leap on all the new stuff, but I also like to have a certain amount of caution about it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I talk to uh, developers, it's like if, if there's one of the main areas of resentment is that oftentimes like if they, if someone wanted to switch over to this new platform that's time that they are stealing away from adding new features that they've been having on the back burner for several years so I, I know this is optional i know this is just a really wonderful thing particularly if you're starting fresh if you're starting something brand new but uh, th there's a reason why carbon lasted for so long it's because so many developers had so many legacy apps that are really really important that have a huge Huge, huge customer base and when it comes to do we support this new feature that all of our customers and all of our users have been clamoring for uh, or do we support or do we uh, code up this new feature that we've been wanting to do for years or do we change this sort of back office part of the system that is going to take away a lot of our resources, take a lot of time, and it's not going to be something that's going to be user facing for several, several years. And they would much rather spend time uh, designing a new icon, for instance, than, <laughs> than getting rid of the carbon code. This is the story of life is there's <laughs> the way Apple pitched so many things yesterday. You, you can't do it all. Yep. <laughs> you have to pick. <laughs> yeah. I, and I know, and that's what my job is going to be over the next couple of weeks is kind of work out what's going to deliver the most value to my customers and me and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think even with like looking at the marzipan stuff, I'm going to, I'm going to say marzipan for the rest of the show. because <laughs> I keep forgetting that they've changed the name um, for them. Even with the marzipan stuff, I think I was, I was saying on, on uh, iOS today, it's like, Maybe that's something that I don't adopt this year. Maybe that's something that is going to take uh, a longer p time to look at until such time as the app would be better than the existing uh, app kit app. Yeah, isn't it, isn't it nice that we that the the integration that they showed off last year, where here are some very very lame transcriptions of iOS apps we put onto the Mac, and it really didn't fill you with a lot of confidence either on this uh, multi-platform system or on Apple's faith in the Mac's future. But now that they've had the opportunity to show a more fleshed out idea of what we mean by code integration between the two platforms. Uh, it's anything that allows developers to have this idea in their head and turn it into a useful app faster, that's going to benefit consumers. So I'm not as yeah. worried about that I used to be last year. I mean, the podcast app, it's very hard to tell the difference between that and uh, uh, in quotes native app. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they, they've done a lot of work in the last year. Yeah. Well, in fact, that was if, if there was a tagline for yesterday's keynote, it would be, Boy, they've done a lot of work. I, have, <laughs> yeah, I can't think of another WWDC or a, for any Apple keynote for that matter where more things were announced. It was just boom, 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 one thing after another. It really felt like Apple has been working really hard this yeah. year. Yeah, not, not I mean, that... that, that not oh. only that, but substantial things like uh, how how many times how many uh, WWDC keynotes do we remember where the big the big hunk on Mac OS was now let's take a well, let's show you new features in the mail app now you can have a different pane now you yeah. can automatically address things and they were basically very very low impact. Uh, what what got canceled? What did not get finished in time for the keynote that required uh, Craig to stretch <laughs> this stretch out the macOS version? But uh, like I, like I said, the reason why this the, the, my own personal like briefing talk on WWDC is so long is that almost every section of it has repercussions that seem to get you excited about the next two years of every single hardware platform in the line. And I am, and I I think you guys would agree. I am so absolutely thrilled that they gave such love to the macintosh yeah 
I wonder yeah. with with, uh, with Project Catalyst slash that sweet almond treat uh, if <laughs> and and maybe with iPad OS because they're now breaking out that special version of iOS that's for the higher end iPads. If there isn't a move, if I'm curious what you think about this. This is kind of a theory, a pet theory of mine. I've, for a long time, I've thought Apple's given up on the Mac. And, you know, they're going to release Xcode for iPad, and that'll be it. It'll be all over. <laughs> they did not, I might point out. Uh, but it does feel like Apple's kind of bifurcating the world. There are serious professionals who are going to lay out a serious amount of dough for serious hardware. And then there's the rest of us who aren't going to use a computer at all. We're going to use iPads and iPhones. Is there much room left for a MacBook Air, a MacBook, a MacBook Pro? I, I think I think there is. I mean, the, the the amount of work that they did with, you know, like putting, say, the podcast app, as we mentioned, and, and things like that, you know, it's clear that they are bringing more of the sort of consumer-focused stuff from iOS over to the Mac. If they if they didn't care about the Mac except point, for, you yeah. know, people who are running thousand-track logic projects or <laughs> rendering... That was quite a demo, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I mean, since we've got a thousand tracks of music, why don't we play four 8K video streams at the same time? Yeah, I'm, I mean... Holy that, cow. The, the well, way you, you've, got, I, you've got you've got a lot of singers now who don't who don't have the technical skills of a couple <laughs> generations ago. It is going to be like record this one note at a time, yeah, put every note yeah. on a separate track. So yeah, it's the future yeah. of music. Uh, but I mean, the, they seem to be still focusing uh, as much on on the consumer side on the Mac. And I, yeah, I guess I mean, you're right. Yes, yes. I think the sure there's an argument that you know we're the somewhat older guard and we we right. like our, our right. laptops and our mac os and stuff but yeah the, i mean let's put it this way um i would say almost none of the developers sitting in the audience for that keynote are going to be able to afford that mac pro so <laughs> you know if we're not the professionals you know there's still a market for us down at the lower end as well james you're not sinking yep. your uh, your massive peak calc earnings into a Six thousand dollar machine plus a six thousand dollar monitor. What's wrong with you? <laughs> I I bought an iMac Pro. I think Apple got their money. Um, yes, that's going to do me for a while. Yeah. And the thing with the, with that Mac Pro that struck me is if we are legitimately like a year away from starting a transition to ARM away from Intel, I would like to buy a computer that maybe has got a, a longer future. That's you an know, interesting if, point. Mm. Although, because, given how modular this is, I it's really just I, I, a box with a bus, right? I mean, I don't oh. know how modular the the CPU stuff was. I mean, uh, yeah. it, it, I mean, it it's a fabulous machine. I am never going to own one. Yeah, um, me, me neither. Every, I would love to, but it's. Uh, and by the way, I, if they're using this uh, Xeon twenty eight core Xeon uh, W processor, that's a ten thousand dollar processor for yeah. twenty eight cores alone. The processor it's, alone. Yeah. So it, it, you're talking a really, fifty grand outlay for a, a fully spec. I yeah. mean, for, for it's, the it's really. The, go ahead, Andy. It's really clear that this is not a computer for the rest of us. This is a computer for a segment of the Mac community, super high-end pro that has never breathed Earth air or experienced <laughs> Earth gravity. That that that. Who, but, but the thing is, I that, just want to know but, who needs one and a half terabytes of RAM. I mean, who is it? Well, it's that's pushing well, that envelope. We're talking. Well, we're is talking that about machine learning. Uh, what is that? No, well, we're talking about stuff like uh, there was a really great. Um, I'm scrolling down because again, I'm going through my notes. There is a, um, a great thread on Twitter by Michael Pusateri who kind of put it into uh, into perspective, saying there are people that are working in pre in pre visualization where here is your big CGI based motion scene and someone wa and uh, that's a walk in through for a corporate video or even for a movie. And now the uh, someone has said, well, what if they're entering from the left instead of the right? The ability to simply make that change, spit out a quick video and show it to them immediately and, and get that kind of iteration on a project really, really, really important. The 
ability to stream multiple to do like host a multiple stream at 4k or 8k that's a really really big deal that's rarefied air and you do need a, a machine with this kind of performance the thing is i don't know that I, I think that the message that needs to come out is that no matter how uh no matter how uh intense you think your need for a desktop is Unless you know every single acronym that's being thrown away, <laughs> thrown out uh, in the description of this thing, it's 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 statistically unlikely that you need this kind of power. Um, Apple, I think, is saying that we created the reason why we we updated the Mac Mini last year to give it so many uh, top end options. If you want to build it out that way, is to say that if you're just doing kind of normal video editing, if you're doing normal production, if you're doing normal photo editing, even if you're doing X code uh, to a, a normal level, spend all your money on either an iMac Pro or on a top of the line Mac Mini. Uh, this is this uh, this new Mac Pro is not for you. You could you're basically throwing money away just to have the prettiest uh, Mac on the desktop. I think a lot of pros actually would be very happy with the Mac Mini, but at the same I, I time, think, you could look at this and you go, God, I'd love to have this. One Expense of the things report, I would report. One of the things I would say is that you know this is. You know, this is technology that we can't afford today and Apple can't put into consumer machines today. But maybe in 10 years, you know, we'll have a thousand track logic projects running right. in, you know, our MacBook equivalent. Or our phone, it, honestly. Or, or our phone or our, our, you know, our watch. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. You I mean, make it, a really yeah, good point, though, James. It'd be a foolish thing to spend that much money on a machine that might only have a few years lifetime now if you're a professional if you're editing you know 8k movies Bye. or making thousand track logic pros it's worth it for two years you can amortize that cost but for yeah, the I mean, rest the, of us maybe it's a good idea be prudent to wait and see what happens with all is none of these machines are going to stop working the day apple ships an arm-based machine it just means that you know the transition has started right and well uh, yeah yeah. Well, 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 a couple of things. Uh, one being that it's uh, again another thing that I've been I've been reading reading people who know more than I do about the about uh, a ten thousand dollar computer and the sort of things they tend to do. One of the things that keeps coming up is that this might be the last time that you can buy something this powerful that sits on one desk, chiefly because for that super super high end stuff, a lot of this work is going towards a virtual virtualized machines right. where you can just bring more cores in as your needs kind of. Of, uh, kind of increase, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. As for Apple going to ARM, I'm not 100% sure that they can build the sort of ARM uh, processors that are going to be able to do that sort of uh, not really consumer, not a Superman Pro user sort of machine. So I think they're still going to need to rely on Intel for that kind of hardware. It'd be interesting if they decided to see, well, what 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 kind of deal can we cut with AMD if Intel is making us upset uh, from time to time about its schedule problems? But I, I would bet that there is there are people in a secret facility somewhere who are trying to make ARM chips go very fast oh, when they are no. cooled and, <laughs> you know, being fed with mains power and don't have to, you know, uh, throttle and all this sort of stuff. So, I, I mean, if anyone could do it, I think Apple can. They've got the the people, and we've seen some amazing silicon that's come out of them. Yeah. Uh, I had a I had a running bet that the the Mac Pro was going to be some sixty four core ARM thing, just because <laughs> if I was right, I would have looked like a, a, a <laughs> genius. absolute genius. You, <laughs> you open but, up the side, and it's, and it's just like one hundred twenty eight Raspberry Pis all networked together. With, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, but you make a but, good point that with the, with things like Google's TPUs. In the cloud, uh, that's going to be in the long run, perhaps uh, for a lot of solutions, a, a better solution. But there are still people who need a lot of silicon no, no, no. on their desktop. I am, I for one, I'm just very, I've, I'm actually very grateful. We've been saying, and I didn't think there was a chance in hell for months on Mac Break Weekly, bring back the cheese grater. Uh, yeah. That was the perfect Mac Pro. It was a foolish thing. Apple finally admitted, I think, to go to the trash can Mac. This was a great design, and when they and they brought yeah. back the cheese grater in spades. I mean, it literally looks like a cheese grater. There were a lot of people who don't remember that that was the nickname for the old Mac Pros who were saying, you know, posting on Twitter, posting pictures. Go ahead, put the cheese grater on the desk. Posting pictures <laughs> of uh, actual literal cheese graters saying it looks like a cheese grater. Well, that's what we called uh, this, and it's very, in many ways, it's very similar to the Tower uh, Mac Pro. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, except, we, I get, what a I great get, device. Get, Go ahead, James. I was just going to say, except I could afford one of those. Yeah. Well, no, I was looking at Twitter. Um, somebody uh, just posted on Twitter, uh, Jimmy Grewal, the first professional Mac prices. I remember the two FX, which we colloquially called the two effing expensive. Yeah. Started at ten thousand yeah. dollars. A Mac two was fifty five hundred but dollars. Two X seventy seven sixty nine. And that was, by the way, this is in nine. This is in two thousand. What is it? Nineteen ninety six dollars. Yeah, is, I'd like to see those adjusted. Yeah, to this is not modern dollars. A two CX was five thousand three hundred sixty nine dollars. Uh, Quadra was 900 was $7,200. So this isn't, I think you made the, a, a, an excellent point, James, which is that's what this costs today. Uh, and it, 10 years from now, it might be in a phone. So, yeah. but it is a beautiful work of art. Uh, stainless steel, and, uh, which is really interesting. Does the Apple logo on that look unusually large? Yeah. But then it looks about the same. It reminds me of what it would have been oh, on the older yeah, machines. Actually, yeah, looking, it looks like the old machines. It is. It's just, in fact, you're right. Boy, you guys have good eyes. It's exactly kinda, the same. I I've got like one under my desk. I, know design <laughs> I forgot how big that was on the old machine. I kind of like the fact that they're taking a design cue for one of the prettiest Macs they've ever made. This is like the G4 cube where tw twist out this this nice handle and the entire thing comes Isn't out. Isn't that sweet? Exposing yeah. all it is sides a cube. It. You're right. It open, it, you take it out and it, it opens it up. Yeah, they also they also make the point that not only I do think that the the new uh, double cheese grater is really really cool looking. They did make the point that it's also functional because it's really all about airflow. Um, a couple people I know who uh, were had uh, access to them uh, at WWDC were saying that it actually sounds a lot quieter than yeah. their yeah. Uh, their iMac Pros uh, in terms of when the fans have to kick in and how the cooling goes. It's so really interesting. They won't, they won't be limited. It's a it's a unique look, and of course it's repeated on the back of the new uh, monitor as well. Uh, I just think this is, watch this, this is so beautiful. Oh, my <laughs> yep. God. And one of the things we liked about the old uh, Tower Mac was the wiring was hidden away. These modules popped in and out. Um, no one in the world needs four Radeon Pro Vega 2s, <laughs> or maybe mm. they do if you have 8K yeah, videos. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, but just, is just, just gorgeous. So you make an interesting point. This, this CPU may not be that modular. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it might be that. That's a logic board. Although, but there's, I mean, there's who still knows? a lot. Who knows? who knows? Yeah, there, there, there's still a lot you can add. Uh, now that they're relying on MPX modules. Now that they're, now that they've got so many uh, PCIe slots, if you want to keep adding hardware accelerators, you can do so without having to go outside through Sun Thunderbolt. Um, but wait we'll a minute, we'll how is he doing that? It looks like we've actually got one delivered. It, <laughs> we've got some sort of weird augmented reality Mac Pro on the on the table here, replacing the old cheese grater. That looks pretty sweet. I think we maybe have to buy one. Just you know, that's that's actually <laughs> that's actually a great product. And someone manufactured <laughs> just something that looks like that shell that's just a little bit larger on top than of the old Mac the cheese grater. You can just uh, lower around inside. it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, where, is this an Apple uh, AR? Um, yeah. So it's something from yeah. AR Kit that Apple's distributing. <laughs> so you could see what it would look like. That's actually doing a really good job of augmented reality. Yeah. It's sitting on the table very nicely. I, wa I, I want to put wheels on the bottom of that and have it motorized so it just follows you around. I just think that <laughs> yeah. that's going to be. At the you got room inside to put that kind of stuff in there. How much do those wheels cost, do you think? What's your bet? <laughs> I bet 500 bucks for the set of four. I, <laughs> you think less? Uh, oh, I if, hope less. If the stand for the monitor is a thousand dollars, yeah, yeah. I mean that that I don't know why they broke the price out for that. If they just said the monitor cost six thousand yeah. dollars, nobody would be sort of poking fun at a thousand dollar stand. That's a good point. I think I understand. For, for instance, in fact, I've texted Alex Lindsay say you're going to buy one. He's not responding, which means he probably already <laughs> did. But uh, I, the. Uh, I think what they're saying is, and remember, they brought in, after the failure of the trash can, remember a couple of years ago, they made the apology. They said, we're working on the next generation Mac Pro. It won't be this year. won't be next year. <laughs> they were right. Uh, it'll be fall of this year. But one of the things they said uh, about it is we brought, it, we actually hired professionals, video editors, music creators, uh, developers. We've hired people to be in our design lab to give us input on what this Mac Pro should be. And Alex Lindsay, for instance, throws away the stands. When he, even when he buys an iMac, he puts a Visa mount on everything in an arm. 
So for I think for some professionals, the idea that this I don't I didn't want the stand. I want the visa mount, or I have my own thing that I'm going to do. Actually, makes sense. But you're right. It is. It became a uh, a uh, a laugh line. I'm surprised uh, Jimmy Fallon didn't mention it on, on <laughs> late night last <laughs> night uh, to have a thousand dollar monitor stand. And yet, but uh, it does some really cool things, right? Yeah, I mean, I think for the people who you know, are buying these whatever $30,000 reference monitors who look at those this and go, it's only $6,000. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> right. that's who this is for. And it's not for me. You know, I've got a really nice screen on on this iMac Pro that I'm looking at now. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's only 5K, yeah. not 6K. And it's not, you know, the full HDR, whatever. It's still a really nice yeah. screen. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's an issue or anything, but I, I would say that this would have been a great opportunity for Apple to impress us with, hey, we can actually design something that's functional and cool that does not cost $1,000. We can actually make something that costs only as much as a mid-range notebook as opposed to <laughs> yeah, a really expensive Apple's, one. That's not Apple's way. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I, hey, look who's it's here. Like, I, it's, like, it's, like when you find, it's like when you find out that someone you really, really like is, oh, well, I, I like that he's so simple. He only wears like these black t-shirts and <laughs> Instead of and instead of thinking, oh, he buys like the Hanes, like beefy tees that are like twenty dollars for a four pack. That no, he buys these three hundred and eighty dollar tees that look exactly like everyone else. Again, you don't think less of them, but it was like, oh, that's a little bit disappointing. Look who has joined us. The beard has appeared. Jim Dalrymple Yay. from the Loop LoopInsight.com. Hi, Jim. How you doing, Leo? Have you been enjoying WWDC so far? I have. I I apologize for being late. You know, I, you had other I, things going on. I'm sure you were watching streams, and in fact, I'm, I'm surprised you're not. I'm surprised you're not down at the McHenry. No, I told you I'd be here waiting for you. Nice, thank yeah. you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, joining us, James Thompson, the creator of Peacock. He's in Glasgow, Ireland. Andy Anako, you know, Glasgow, Jim, Scotland. Sc did Scotland, I say Scotland. Ireland? I am so sorry. <laughs> just you know, just some. You uh, can hit me if you want. That's terrible. How close are you to the castle where the, the Game of Thrones episode three was filmed? Um, I don't know. There's a lot of the castles are in Northern Ireland, but there is, I think, Winterfell is in Scotland. Nice. Uh, I have not visited. Oh man, but... looked cold. That's all I can say. <laughs> looked really, <laughs> really, really cold. So, uh, Jim, we've been talking about the Mac Pro, and and again, I just want to say thank you, Apple, for listening because this is, I think, what. I wanted, I think what most pros wanted, I'm not going to buy one, but I think it is exactly what a Mac Pro uh, should be. Look at the cooling in this thing. This thing, let me, let me, I love the animations on these websites. Uh, I guess I can't, I can't get it to do it again. But the cooling on this thing, it has a one, what was it a 1.4 kilowatt power supply? I mean, yeah, this thing is amazing. 1.5 terabytes of memory, 12 DIMM slots. Um, in, in 256 gigabytes SSD stock. That was oh, the dear. weirdest thing. Yeah. yeah. But I guess with all those Thunderbolt ports, you're probably going to use an ex faster external you, drive anyway. You have to get that entry level price down somehow. Jeez Louise. <laughs> Come on, guys. It's not that expensive for a terabyte SSD anymore. There was some, some people were saying that these SSD speeds they're quoting are not particularly good. I think 2400. Uh, megabits per second, uh, or is it gigabits per second? Read and write. I think it was megabits per second. Read and write. Not super fast, but maybe you can speed that up. Thunderbolt certainly could do better than that. I had a chance to see one yesterday. Oh, tell us. And about it. <gasps> it looks beautiful. It was. It was. It was beautiful. Yeah. But <laughs> from a pro pr perspective, um, I went into. They had a different. Uh, session set up where we could go take a look at the the Mac Pro in action, and of course I went right to the music one. Yep. <laughs> so they had um, a Pro Tools project that was recorded in Abbey Road Studio. It had hundreds of tracks on this um, project, and the 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 big difference was that. When it was first recorded, they recorded a full orchestra. That needed its own machine. And its own giant room. <laughs> and, <laughs> so they recorded the uh, the orchestra on a separate machine. They, yeah. I, I believe they had something else that they had to record on a separate machine. Maybe it was a, a second piece of the orchestra. 
finished. And then they had a third machine Jeez. that was dedicated to, um, you know, all the other instruments that they were recording. And then they had video that was embedded in there. So all of this took three machines to do in Abbey Road when they recorded it. It was all running on one Mac Pro. Wow. Wow. And it was incredible. And, you know, being an audio guy, I I know what plugins, um, you know, will affect the, the power and CPU of an audio project. So I had the guy scroll over. I said, no, 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 no. I, I want to see what you're running here. So he scrolled over and all the tracks, plugins were running live. Uh, they had some outboard gear uh, from Universal Audio there. And Universal Audio will take up a lot of, of power, even though they offload it to, uh, to its own cards. Uh, the DSP, it's still, you know, it, it takes up some, some processing from the computer. And they had a lot of other plugins installed too. So this is all going live while they're playing it. And they brought three computers into one, and it was seamless. And there was still lots of of power left on this machine. So, how, was you know, it a fully that, uh, fully equipped machine? Did they say how it was equipped? Uh they didn't. They didn't. But I I just assumed that it was fully equipped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is when you're talking pros. That's what you're talking. You know, you're you're looking at at situations where uh, music studios they also had a logic set up uh, uh, the same way. So when you're looking at that, and you're a music studio, you say, okay, one machine, three machines. I mean, it it was it was powerful and it was doing amazingly well. Is and it, both of them were playing video at the same time. Is it uh, as beautiful in person as it looks? Yes. <laughs> it really looks I stunning. mean, it's obviously very familiar. Yeah. You know, we, we've seen that, uh, that type of design. And so you look at it and say, okay, now it's like a hyper cheese grater instead of just the, <laughs> the cheese grater that we were used to. But I mean, it, it looked really, really nice. And when I had my studio before, I mean, I, I would record the entire band. I was, you know, I had um, Mackie boards set up so that I could control everything. And it was all going into one of the cheese grater Mac pros. Um, but, you know, with that, that many mics and that much processing, sometimes it would hiccup a bit, not much, but this just wouldn't. I mean, there's no way that I could have enough power um, or, or enough inputs going into that to even make it hiccup. It, it was incredible. And and that is a pro machine right yeah, there. Yeah. When you can take three and bring it down to one, I mean, I, I know that, that people are talking about the cost, but the cost for somebody like Abbey Road Nothing. is, Nothing. is time and processing yeah, and yeah. extra computers. And right. you, you put all those together to make this project. And, you know, if they can do it in one, well, that's cost well spent. How about the uh, Pro Display XDR? Did you get to see that? I did. And unfortunately, uh, because I was so enamored with what was going on. <laughs> You're looking at the, uh, look at the music, the, not the, the music stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I kept trying to, to trick them. I'll tell you, I kept. You know, scroll over. Let me see the plug. I love that. I no, to see, that's great. Are they all active? I'm you glad know, you were you there. Trying to do something here. Yeah. So uh, the pro display was there. I didn't get a chance to see it a lot, but it, it looked amazing. I didn't talk about it a lot. I realized that after I left. <laughs> you know, like damn, <laughs> damn. I should have looked at the pro display. Yeah. How quiet so, was that machine running all of those tracks? Uh, you couldn't hear it at all. You couldn't hear it at all, wow. and and this was this was this was a closed off type of uh, what would be a studio setting. Obviously, it wasn't you know complete, but it was a closed off area in a room. So if there was any massive amount of noise, you would have heard it. And at times, he he quieted the music, pulled down the uh, uh, the switches, and and you know nice. muted the music just so, so that I could it. talk to him. Yeah. And wow. so we were standing there talking right beside the machine. 
and there was there was nothing. And it it had to be even according to the to the CPU lever um, um, meters, it, it it was working hard. So you know, it wasn't at a time when right. he com- he didn't stop playing the music. Right. He just muted it. Right. So wow. there was no noise. You know, no discernible noise anyway. Pretty. So I was impressed. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, as a, a present, my birthday is coming in September. Leo. <laughs> <laughs> now let's see the XDR display six thousand, the base model, but it's only two hundred fifty six gig uh, storage. I think you're going to have to maybe. I mean, and and really, is eight cores enough after all? Uh, I think we're going to need more than that. Um, I think we're talking ten grand. Uh, 12 grand, 15 grand. I think we're talking about $20,000 for even a moderately equipped system if you want to Thank get you. display. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's the great thing about all those open drive bays. You, if you if need be, you can actually live inside it, like if it's going to be <laughs> that and housing. Oh, it's my new house. And you can put wheels on it and drive it around. I love yeah. it. You can put wheels on it. I think that's a great thing. Uh, it's also, there's a rack mountable version of it. And ever since Apple killed the X-Serve, I thought, gee, Apple doesn't want to be in the data center. How do you rack mount a trash can? Uh, people did it, but not not well. Uh, the fact that there's a rack mount version, again, tells me Apple's just really been listening. And they, I think we give them a hard time. I give them a hard time for not listening. This I want to give them a, lo a lot of praise for really listening to what serious pros wanted and stepping up. Um they, th this is this is the situation where I think Apple was given a hard time, and and rightfully so, they they deserve that hard time for for the Mac Pro, um, but they answered in spades. I yeah. mean, yeah, I, I was I was expecting a powerful machine. I I was, but I wasn't expecting what they gave us. Yeah, I was really surprised. Uh, one that. suspects so, that they said to the designers, do not consider cost. Well, I mean, I, if you're looking at pros, again, the, I don't think that the... That no, there's nothing the wrong cost. with that. That's right. Pros aren't yeah. looking at the cost. But I'm just saying, normally, I mean, even with uh, the original Mac and with the uh, iMac, Jobs would sometimes, you know, I, I remember the story, Johnny Ive saying, you want a handle on that? That's going to cost you. And Jobs said, no, we're going to do it. But most of the time, you have to consider the cost of manufacture, the difficulty of manufacture, the final cost of the product. Will anybody buy it? But every once in a while, uh, you get a chance to say, look, we're not going to worry about how much it costs to make. What would be the best thing you could do? I have a feeling even those holes are, not, are expensive, <laughs> right? Yeah. But I think isn't that what they they kind of did with the the trash can Mac Pro? They wanted something that would appeal to everybody to have a Mac Pro on their their desk, and you know they made this beautiful looking yeah. But uh, the trash designers can, overruled the engineers. That was the pro I think the problem. Right? right. So now they went the opposite way. Exactly. And what worked? Well, the the Cheese Gator Mac Pro worked great. I would. I, I had a G5 of that. I have an Intel version. Yep. Of, I mean, that thing just worked amazingly well. We still have half so, a dozen here. I mean, yeah, they they went back to that design, but they powered it like crazy. And that's what people want. That's what they wanted. They had a 3D wanted. studio set up in there. They had a photography studio set up in there. Um, it, it was just the the things that they were doing on they had green screens they had everything set up in there every type of major pro workflow from video 3D um you know music everything was there not just so, a call back to the cheese grater mac though call back to the iMac the Luxo lamp iMac with that stand in the arm yeah yeah <laughs> uh i remember jobs agonized over that arm and getting it right and making it so it wouldn't wear out and it looks like that engineering has lived on uh, with this new stand. That iMac, that was, Peak Out got bundled on that iMac. No kidding. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so we we made a decent chunk of change That's nice. out of that. That was a beautiful Mac, that Luxo Lamp Mac. Yeah. 
not only that, but let's not forget that it was not just really cool looking, but it was absolutely functional. It echoed the original Mac having a handle in the back of it. You could actually carry that iMac from one place to another just by holding on to the neck of that lamp without risking breaking it. And the ability to have one computer that will adjust to uh, parents' height, eye height, all the way down to like a little kid being able to adjust to that. that that's Apple design at its best. Really, really cool. Yes, and yes, it costs a bit, but it really opens up the potential of how you can use a piece of hardware. And uh, mm. if you want to play with that augmented reality we're playing with, it's actually on the Apple <laughs> webpage. You have to use Safari uh, and then surf to that page. And I've done that. And one of the beautiful things you can do, I don't know, do you have a shot of uh, over my shoulder? You don't have that shot at all? Oh, too bad. One of the things you can do is you can make it bigger or smaller. <laughs> so now I have a little mini version of it. <laughs> uh, let's take a little break. We'll talk more about uh, WWDC. James Thompson, the creator of PCALC, is with us from Glasgow, which is now in Scotland, I understand. Uh, yeah. thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Another, another tax dodger, huh? <laughs> they moved it to Scotland. Uh, also, uh, Jim Dalrymple, thank you so much for being here, Jim. Uh, he, I, I imagine you're going back to the convention center right after the, the show. As soon as we're done here, I'm heading back to nice. WDC. In yeah. that case, I'm very grateful that you took time for us. I really appreciate it. And Andy Anako has got nothing better to do. So uh, back in the, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Back in the library, I see. No, I'm just teasing you. You're it, in the it, library. It, I love it. It wouldn't hurt if it weren't true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, Andy, of course, is heard regularly on Boston Public Radio, WGBH. Yes, it's great to have you. all three of you here. Our show today brought to you by the best little Wi-Fi device you ever saw. In a way, you know, this is, this, this to me reminds me a little bit of Apple design. This is an Eero Beacon, E-E-R-O. This beacon, I have actually uh, quite a few in the house. I think I have four or five beacons, an Eero base station. This is the best Wi-Fi I've ever had. It solves all our Wi-Fi woes. What happened when Wi-Fi first started, right? You had a couple of computers. You didn't have Amazon Echoes. You didn't have Netflix. You didn't have a whole bunch of other stuff. But as we've laden all this stuff on top of our Wi-Fi signal, it's just stopped working. And then there's the neighbor who's blasting her Wi-Fi out over the airwaves. It's it's physics. Wi-Fi is kind of basically, it's, it's like light waves. Wi-Fi doesn't go through walls well either. And so you wouldn't set up a table lamp in your living room and expect to read a book in your bedroom. Well, you got to do the same thing with Wi-Fi. You need a distributed system. In fact, if Enterprise has been using it for years. We've had distributed Wi-Fi for uh, years in our studios. Now you can have it in your home. But the great thing about this is it's easy to set up. With the Eero app on your phone, You it'll walk you through <clears throat> every step of the process, where to put your beacons for maximum performance, you can manage that network, too, right from your phone. You'll know how many devices are connected at any given time. You'll have the Internet speed you're getting from your service provider. It does a bandwidth test every night. I love that. Um, let me just open up the Eero app on my phone. I actually monitor my mom's Eero network as well because when I got the new Eero uh, beacons, I replaced her bad Wi-Fi with Eero. And since she's in Rhode Island... Um, I can uh, easily check how she's doing. Let's just see here. Oh, look. Uh, her Eero is just updated to Eero OS 3.130. That's another great thing I love about the Eero. And and actually, this is a rule of thumb. Stacy Higginbotham uh, of Stacy on IoT and uh, This Week in Google uh, said, every IoT device in your house from now on must have automatic over-the-air updates for security Eero does, and it's updated regularly. Let's just see how my mom, her bandwidth isn't great, but she doesn't need a whole lot of bandwidth. Six megabits down, three megabits up. What's nice, though, is I could see that all the Eros in her house are playing nicely, getting good throughput. I could see all the devices connected. I could see she just got the update. Let me uh, switch over uh, to my network here. I'm going to switch networks to, that's her network, to my network. And uh, I can see how many devices, I'm just curious how many devices are on my network right now. Uh, 32 connected devices, uh, and that's only because I'm not home. <laughs> it would go up by about five or six if I were home. But we're getting 94 down, 12 megabits up. I could see, and, oh, let me show you, Eero Plus. This is fantastic. We have a teenager in the house, 
Uh, I use Eero Plus. This is well worth it for its advanced security. It prevents access to sites that host malicious content, viruses, botnets, phishing sites automatically. It has ad blocking if you want to use that. And for Michael, our teenager, I use the safe filters. So I apply it just to Michael's devices. Uh, all of his devices are named and in his personal Eero portfolio, which is nice because come around 10 p.m., I also turn off the Internet. Bedtime, Michael. I love that feature. In fact, it's his new favorite thing. Can I have 10 minutes more of Wi-Fi, please? Please, just, just five minutes more. I love to see teenagers beg. Eero keeps us safe at home with reliable security. And it doesn't just defend our Eros. It defends every device in our house. So Eero Plus is well worth it. Um, it tags sites that contain violent, illegal, or adult content. We can choose what uh, Michael can see and not see and what I can see and not see. It is just great. And I control it from the app. He can't turn the Wi-Fi on, but I can. I can actually tell my Amazon Echo, Eero, pause Michael's Wi-Fi. It's a great punishment. Very satisfying. Never think about Wi-Fi again. $100 off the Eero base unit with two beacons and a year of Eero Plus. That's nice. Just go to Eero.com slash MacBreak. If you use the code MacBreak, you'll save $100. E-E-R-O dot com slash MacBreak. Life's too short for bad Wi-Fi. You owe it to yourself. E-E-R-O dot com slash MacBreak. If you use the code MacBreak, you'll save $100. We thank Eero for their support, for making a great Wi-Fi system. We thank you for using that Eero special Eero address, letting them know you heard about it on MacBreak Weekly. <sighs> okay. Let's see. Oh, there's cheese grater wallpaper. I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm putting this on my uh, on my Windows machine right now. <laughs> 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 That's gonna make people crazy. Look at that cheese grater wife. Oh, it's getting oh oh it's getting bigger. Wow, that is really sweet. Thank you, Apple. There's so if engineers with kids, they're gonna be so many crayons shoved through that. <laughs> oh my god. Well it's nice as they melt as you push them through, so it's perfect, you know. It's there you a, go. It's like a little crayon melting device. Um it is Pride Month. So <laughs> I'm a I have a rainbow Mac Pro. <laughs> um I guess we could talk about the specs on the display. Uh they showed and they were probably right to do so, a fifty thousand dollar professional display. Uh, they said these are things are expensive, but now you can get all of that in uh, a mere six thousand dollar display if you get the monitor stand. Uh, that's that's a, a nice device. Let's talk about um, what's happening to the iPad. I thought that was very interesting. They're yeah. they're literally calling it iPad OS now. Yeah, and I I think that that is a more a marketing thing than an actual engineering. It's still iOS, right, James? Yeah, I mean. Most everything bar the Mac is iOS under the somewhere. But yeah, they I call it Watch is, OS, TV OS, iOS, iPad OS. It's all iOS. But I think this is basically exactly iOS. You know, it, it, it's the, <laughs> the same code that's running on the phone. It's okay. just. Does it say, the, oh, you're, oh, I'm on an iPad, I'm going to do something different? I am, well, yeah. I mean, it's like apps. You can't uh, do those system. things on a phone, though. No, no, no. But it, it's. I don't think that, you know, somebody has taken the source for iOS and moved it into yeah, a yeah. separate room. You know, this, this <laughs> yeah. is... Well, the, the Apple, is, Apple is clear that it is iOS. They're just, it's the, they're creating not, not even a fork of it, but basically a superset of it. Kind of like the way they used to talk about OS X being at the core of everything that they're doing, that Mac OS X is different from iOS, even though they have essentially the same stuff at the core. They just added stuff to, the, to iOS that a Mac doesn't need, and they've added stuff to Mac's, uh, Mac OS that uh, iOS doesn't need. I thought I, I, even if it is... Uh, a change in name only, and I don't think that's necessarily true. That is a powerful statement, though, that you're targeting, instead of uh, conceptually writing an app that could be, I'm generating code that could be for an iPad, it could be for iOS. Ideally, I'm creating uh, one app that could transmogrify itself, depending on what device it's on. The mindset of saying, no, I'm creating a app that's designed to exclusively take advantage of things that are special to the iPad, the larger size screen, uh, the fact that uh, 
the, the the fact that split view works in pretty much everything any other features they choose to come up with the f idea that in the future there might be special apis or special app permissions that you can only get on uh, an ipad os app that you can't get uh, on an ios app uh, it, uh, more than anything else though, i think it really is a, a nod to how serious apple is about promoting the ipad uh, the ipad pro as a real computer that uh, this is a statement that they can definitely defend that anytime over the past two or three years that someone has complained that yeah but geez uh, apple uh, apple computers are only for people who can uh, afford to buy luxury macbooks and luxury desktops uh, they can they can very credibly say that well we do make really good three hundred twenty nine dollar computers and really good seven hundred dollar computers they're just called iPads so if all this is is the ability to really get the entire community of users and developers to take this seriously not as this is not just a, a movie uh, this is not just something for watching movies on this is not just something for Instagramming or Facebooking this really is something that you can take on a three or four day business trip and not just again entertain yourself on the flight. But actually get real work done. Uh, that's uh, it. It doesn't look like much right now, but two years from now, if they decide to finally just admit it and add a pointing device, add a trackpad, or add an optional mouse to it, it will be absolutely more natural to make that an iO an iPad OS exclusive than as something that could conceivably be misinterpreted as a feature that could work with an iPhone as well. Really interesting move. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think the, it, it, really Go freeze out. Go ahead, Jim, and too. then uh, James. Yeah. Um, you know, this with it felt before like Apple wanted to do something different with the iPad, but couldn't because they were kind of constrained with what people expected in iOS. But now now that it's separate, they have uh, the ability to go in and do some some really great things with iPad OS uh, for what that crowd wants and make it different from iOS on the, the phone. And I think that's great. You know, it's going to be a good thing because you'll have, you know, features in Mac OS, you'll have features in iPad OS, and then features for truly mobile in, in I, iOS. Apple did confirm after the event that it will support all iPads. It's not just for the iPad yeah. Pros, which is interesting. James, go ahead. I no, sure. I, I was going to say, like, the, the stuff that they have introduced, the, the multiple Windows support and the sort of spaces and expose concepts coming over from the Mac, that's the, you know, the interesting thing to me, uh, and it makes a big difference. Uh, mm. and yeah, I felt like a lot of this stuff came from, and Andy, you're probably using Android P or Q. Q. Yeah, so a lot of this came over from Android Q, uh, dark mode. Uh, Google's been doing that gradually over time. Uh, the widgets, swipe keyboards, swipe yeah. keyboards. Um, well, just the idea of having a new home screen just for the iPad so long and oh coming and will be God. such a big deal. This was ridiculous. The amount of wasted territory on an iPad with that home, same home screen grid you'd see on an iPhone was insane. Now, do we know, it says you pin your favorite today view widget on the home screen. Do we know if this is they can only live on the left? Can they live on multiple screens? Can you? Do we know anything about that, Jim? Were, were you able to play with the uh, iPad OS at all? I, I was not. No, yeah. you were too I busy staring at that, that. <laughs> at that Happy Road demo. <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling you were mesmerized for hours. <laughs> I just I just stood there and looking at it and asking questions. Uh, James, have you seen anything that indicates? No, what this I mean I've I've like run virtual iPads, but I didn't even think to check about the okay. the widget stuff. I was just mm -hmm. trying to get. Uh, all my code working again. So uh, you down, you have downloaded night. iOS 13 developer preview. Yeah, I've got that, and I've got um, uh, Catalina installed and okay. the new Xcode and things like that. Can you, so are I, you allowed in in days bef gone by? You couldn't talk about it if you had it, but I think now they've removed that, right? Uh, I don't think <laughs> if I say anything that's covered by the keynote and the, okay. the State of the it's Union, that's knowledge. usually fine, yeah. but. To be honest, Apple, I think, has not really cared for many years. Uh, Especially about that. since there's a public beta coming in a couple of months, right? I mean, any. But you never know when they will start caring again. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. That one. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, that is true. Uh, like but, in, like in Russia, they don't care that you've been bribing public officials. They're counting on it. But if they decide you need to be put in jail and your money taken away, <laughs> suddenly 
<laughs> they charge you with bribing a public official, yes. I, I, I'm glad we have a better screen layout. Uh, looks like you can really get a lot of icons into this grid now, which is great. Making room for widgets from the uh, Today View, which is really nice uh, as well. Yeah. I've, I use that on Android all the time. Um, but there are really no good Android tablets, so this will be this will be an, right. a, a different experience. Pencil has a lot of very nice uh, new features, which is good because that's one of the things that's unique. Um, they didn't mention mousing, but Renee Ritchie did go backstage and was able to confirm that yes, as we had thought, the mouse support in the iPad is in accessibility. So you now he didn't mention trackpad, so we know at least. Mouse support. He also said full keyboard control for the entire UI, which I really liked. So you have three different ways now that you can control the UI with mouse, full keyboard controls, which for me is very important. I actually work in command line a lot. I don't want to put my hand even on a mouse, let alone touch the screen. So keyboard control is really important to me. And they showed yeah. off the voice control. Uh, and that was very impressive as well. But we should, we should point out that I think it's really significant that they put all that stuff that is could be transformative for the iPad, and they put it in access accessibility, which is places where it's not just a convenience for someone like me. It is some. It is a feature for people who could not make full feature. use of the thing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but none. The, but the thing they gave a spotlight on was the one part of their iPad uh, section that kind of got me confused. In that, yes, we're all sort of uh, really really hungry for give us some mouse, give us mouse support, give us uh, uh, give us some sort of a uh, uh, trackpad support, and say good news. We listen to you, and here are new. Triple finger taps to get to oh, move man. and cut and paste text. It's like, okay, I absolutely don't care. If I'm going to be, uh, it's so hard to remember all of these new, like multiple finger taps. When, if I'm going to be doing text manipulation of that kind, I'm probably going to have a keyboard in front of me. This is the sort of stuff that's so dead easy if you've got a mouse or a trackpad. Again, it's it's if for people who use that feature and take advantage of it, it's going to be great. And I don't begrudge that, but it, seems like a step backward to say here's another opportunity for you to take your hands off of the keyboard you're using or another opportunity to do something in a way that's hard to remember and is going to take a while to learn before it becomes intuitive when we really just want let us have let us do more stuff with a pencil let us do when we don't have a, a, a third another sort of input device and then when we do have another sort of input device make sure the keyboard works amazingly well for selecting and moving stuff and give us a mouse finally you were, were you jim were you at the you were in the keynote right yes you must have felt for toby peterson the apple engineer when he just couldn't get those gestures working. He said, oops, sorry, oh, no. <laughs> and it, uh, it happens in every demo. It has to happen. Yeah. It's what demos do. And yet, I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't like to stand up there in front of 5,000 <laughs> yeah. people and demo something. I could be nervous in I that guess. situation as it well. It also, though, shows how, I mean, I. it's very identifiable. It happens to me all the time. I'm trying to do swipe and stuff, and it's very feels finicky and fussy. Um, and I don't well, know if they now fixed imagine that. Imagine trying to do do it all on a piece on a of stage. beta software. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's true. To say nothing of the fact that we don't know, like maybe maybe it worked one way with one set of gestures up until four days ago, right? And he had committed yeah. that to muscle memory. <laughs> that that's the that's a level of hell that's only reserved for people who are really horrible <laughs> in their previous life. Um, okay, so we'll just take it for granted. I agree with you, Andy. Sometimes these gestures are very hard. Are they're not discoverable? They're hard to remember. Um, and maybe they don't ever get used again. But it's nice that they put them in there. I mean, how uh, many I fingers also, am I going to have to use here? Go ahead, James. I think there's also some of it is, you know, we, we've we grown up with using keyboards and, True. you know, our, our commands C, command V shortcuts for 30 plus years. I don't want to think about the number. And, you know, there are people growing up who are more used to tablets than they are to using True. keyboards and yeah. things. So there's yeah, sliding that, and that, swiping that, and you know, three finger that, three that's finger true. undo. I'm never going to remember <laughs> three finger yeah. undo. It's just that we don't uh, we don't see a whole lot of companies that are issuing their people tablets uh, uh, when they do issue them tablets like the like uh, the touch device that uh, Leo is using. They also get a keyboard and a mouse. Right. So that that is that is an excellent point for consumer level stuff. But there's something about the tactile interface that, in terms of speed and efficiency. 
I don't think that anybody has come up with an alternative to it. Uh, Apple Apple doesn't have to. It's not like uh, the iPad is doomed if they don't have mouse support. It's just that they are making so many huge steps forward in making this into something where, gosh, why would I even want to have a $1,000 Windows notebook when I can have, for the same amount of money, something that's lighter, sleeker, faster, more secure, more private, uh, and I can do all my work on. It just seems like if you add this one thing, it's the one thing that says, oh, well, that's an argument that I can no longer make against it. Yes, I'm definitely buying an iPad Pro right now. I, lo I love that. But speaking of, speaking of complaints, the biggest thing was the update to files. That is like the biggest pain point that I have had as an iPad user is always I've got a file right here here i've got an ipad right here i need to get the file into this thing so i can use it uh, and the ability to simply let's just update the files app to just be able to recognize pretty much anything that's plugged into the usb port let's also make sure that it also uh, recognizes samba so it will just simply mount <laughs> mount my file server right on my network i haven't i haven't used it myself i don't have the i don't have uh, the, the dev version installed but i've been talking to a couple of devs who did have it installed they confirmed that nope my my sm B uh, shares just completely showed up and just moving things in and out. Oh my goodness, that is just such a luscious feature to have. And the fact that it will even work on my old uh, first generation iPad Pro is like, oh, I was I was so ready to buy a new iPad, iPad Pro just to get this feature, but oh well, I guess I'll just keep using my old one. Yeah. What a what a nice feature! It is nice to see I, that Type C port used too. Go ahead, James. I believe Steve Troughton Smith plugged in a 10 terabyte Drobo into it, and it worked perfectly. <laughs> yep. Of yes. course he did. <laughs> He's got all the code on there, right? Uh, <laughs> that is uh, that is good news. That's really good news. And of course, photographers have bemoaned the fact that you had to import photos, even if you could attach a card, which you could, but you had to then import the photos into photos and then import it into Lightroom. Even simple things like going directly to Lightroom uh, will make a big difference yeah. i'm interested uh, though in the ui uh, changes so maybe we can go through some of some of these because ultimately if you're going to use the ipad as a replacement for a desktop there's a few things files for sure it has to do but once you get the files in there and you're running the apps um you know the ipad is a full screen interface uh but a, i think pcalc would live very happily in slide over right james yeah and, and it does yeah um, yeah so I think one of the things for me is possibly, uh, and for many apps, is uh, being able to create multiple windows and handle them. Yes. So mm. you could have, I don't know how useful, but people ask for it. You know, you could have multiple calculators open at once uh, if you're doing two different things. That uh, seems that's... like such a simple thing. Remember, there was a Safari. There was an app that gave you a second Safari. So that you just hmm. just yeah, could have two yeah. browser windows open, but now it looks yeah. like every app. Is there anything you have to do to pcalc to yeah. make? Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's work involved in doing this. Uh, it's not uh, it's not something you get for free. Uh, Is it just just a second instance of your app, or I, it's not quite that? But there's these. Uh, I can't remember the name for them, but the, there's these objects that sort of manage the windows, and you just create multiples of those. Uh, and, you know, it's going to depend on the app how easy it is for them to add something like that. Uh, yeah, I'm trying I, to conceptually can... understand it because it, it's not you, the code you've got on the iPad isn't windowed code per se, or is it? No, but uh, I mean, it is, but there's just one window. There's just one so, region. You write into one region. Yeah, what, what, and you can create now multiple of them and look after them and okay. create user interface in those. That sounds like a lot of new code. Um, I don't know. I haven't done it. I, I don't think it's going to be too bad. I think uh, there's some of my underlying code make some assumptions, which I will need to change. But uh, I can see for a lot of apps, it would be quite useful, you know, just being able to have multiple uh, mail messages open at once and oh, look yeah. at them yeah. and compare things like that. So I presume all of Apple's apps will... Uh support it I, I i would assume so i mean yeah. i think there's still some of apple's apps that don't support uh split screen <laughs> yeah, so right. uh, well, <laughs> hopefully uh, all of their apps will support but you have to every third-party developer will have to make uh, uh, some yeah. significant yeah. changes to their apps to support that, that'll be one of the things that uh we're, we'll all be doing over the summer ah congratulations you've got your summer vacation <laughs> planned uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you My only... summer vacation is in December. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, but I'm glad. I mean, this that that by itself is a significant uh, improvement. Oh, the definitely. ability to look at multiple, pre, kind of a recent uh, uh, carousel and slide over. That's fantastic. So I can I can see what I you know what I've used before. Yeah. That's that's as close as you can get with to true windowing. I think on a on an iOS device. Yeah. Also, I have to For say now. that I never got used to when they when they changed the way that you you could load it, you could uh, uh, introduce a slide over or a side by side app. I never got the hang of how you make that happen. So I'm glad yeah. I'm glad to see this this update to the way it works. So, Jim, you think that maybe at some point there'll be it'll become a true windowing operating system? Yeah, I, I think that with iPad, you know, this is one of the things like having iPad OS that frees them up yeah. to to do some things that doesn't make any sense on the iPhone, but for for the iPad, it really does. And it helps people be more productive. So I would expect to see a lot more features like this and these features be expanded. Um, and, you know, over time, we're going to see what Andy was saying, you know, like a, a, a an operating system for a device that's even more useful than it is now, whether you're using a Mac or or an iPad, because essentially it is just a different version of a computer. The operating system has a long way to go uh, to meet the expectations that we have for a computer. But this, to me, this shows that they're willing to get there. Yeah. They, uh, while well, they killed Dashboard, apparently, finally, in Catalina, <laughs> finally, there is no more Dashboard. They have added spaces uh, to uh, iPad. I guess they've always been there, the idea that you could swipe back and forth, but now you can actually see what spaces are open um, with, within an app, which is, is kind of cool. I think that is a move towards desktop computing in, in some ways. Is it... Is it me or have I? I've never heard them call it spaces before. That's a no. I don't think they've ever used that. That's a Mac OS before. term. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very, I think telling maybe. Now oh, you've got spaces. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We talked about the home screen. We talked about the pencil. I'm just going through all the new features. Uh, markup is kind of cool. One of the things I really love about this Surface Studio is I can uh, double click the top of the pencil or the pen, I guess Microsoft calls it. And uh, take a page and then annotate it, which is which is a really nice feature for something like this. Well, now you can do that on the iPad too. You can uh, mark up web pages, but you can even mark up documents, as it says right here, or email. Yeah. <laughs> and I can erase it too with the eraser, uh, which I think is going to be uh, very handy. In fact, that's a, a use case for the iPad that I could see just by itself. I think Samsung's Note really. <laughs> Sold yeah. a lot of uh, Samsung sold a lot of notes uh, just because you could have a pencil and do that on the note. Being able to do this on the iPad will be fantastic, I think. Yeah, and there, there, there's, there's also blow up like the note did. <laughs> <laughs> I think Apple's got that battery technology under control. Yeah, I, one would or, at least, or at least it, or at least it's a bigger it's a bigger device and it's flatter, so there's more room for the battery to bulge. Yeah, that's before. right. That's probably it's, it's, <laughs> that's it's, right. it's got its own crumple zone for the battery. Um, but we also we also got that sort of wish on a monkey's paw feature where okay, you wish for the ability to install fonts on the iPad. Whoa, We've given yes. that to you. Holy cow! <laughs> but but we you'll have to buy them through the app store as opposed to taking the font library you've been standardized on for the past 10 years and using that. Oh, is that how they're going to do it? Oh. I could I, I could be wrong, but it it's, says but get the, fonts all the, all from the, the app store. You're right. Every, yeah. Or everything I've seen has said that. And the, there, yeah. there might be a way around it. Again, this is a day old information and a lot there and a lot of things are being probably said in greater detail, but I haven't seen anybody in Apple or outside mention that you can just get a true type font and throw it in there. I imagine but a lot of type, plus. a lot of type foundries will be celebrating because there's a chance <laughs> And maybe yeah. they'll charge a buck or two bucks, but that's going to be a lot of incremental income. Uh, you know, yeah, for just type throw, throw in a, throw in an iOS or iPad OS. I got to train myself to say iOS or iPad OS app, uh, and uh, you can hopefully anything you've already bought, like through Comic Craft or whatever, can be available and installed through there. That would but be like, nice, but yet, but... like you said, of course, could be for just a dollar per font. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure Apple's happy to get 30% of that business as well. You bet. <laughs> yep. Always, always. Let's see. So, yeah, the fonts are here. Text editing. We did talk about these uh, gestures. I I, I don't know if I'm going to really be able to uh, get used to the, 
the three <laughs> finger pinch and the for copy and then the what is paste? I forgot. I've already forgotten. Uh, you can copy with the I three finger. I think they finger. say three finger spread. Oh which... Lord! Yep. <laughs> so oh geez. So you copy with a three finger spread uh, pinch. You paste with a three finger spread, and you undo with a three finger swipe left. But the good news is we have five fingers, sense. so that gives us lots more uh, capability coming ahead. I just, I just think it's, I just think it's mean spirited that all we're doing is talking about new, new finger gesture features, and now we have to go for the explicit tag on this podcast. <laughs> finger <laughs> gestures, cursor navigation—that's um, different. The, what they've had is you, you can long press the keyboard and move the cursor around. But it sounds like now you can just drag the cursor around on the screen uh, and select. And uh, this was all the things that uh, Apple's engineer had a hard time with. And intelligence text selection, um, which would knows, I guess, sentences, words, and even paragraphs. One tap, or two taps for a word, three taps for a sentence, four taps with a paragraph. Swipe in the keyboard. Ken Kashenda uh, tweeted uh, that uh, they had rejected swipe. He was, of course, the developer of the original iPhone keyboard. Rejected swipe. They said people don't like it. He was wrong. People love it. <laughs> yep. And Apple uh, now, 11, 12 years later, is finally uh, putting it on uh, their keyboard. Also, the ability to shrink the keyboard down to yeah, the iPhone yeah. size. This is, this, it's perfect for how, how you use the iPad, where you don't necessarily want to reveal an entire keyboard just to type in a search term or just to do something like that. Just the ability to just surface that right below my thumb, let me swipe in the two simple English words and then get out of my way again. That's great. James, do you use the, the keyboard um, routines for a PCALC or is it all your... Yeah, your... Oh, it's got full keyboard support. So um, you will benefit from this as well, I guess. Well, I mean, not specifically from that little uh, drag around keyboard, <laughs> but... Um... Oh, come on, you can find something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I can. If you have not used the PCALC about box, just do it. I won't, no, no, no <laughs> spoilers, but just do it. It's uh, you, you make amazing use of all of, I think, every single one of Apple's uh, uh, kits. In, uh, I, I, I try to. It's a good marketing <laughs> uh, technique. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, here's an example of some of the keyboard shortcuts for physical keyboards. This is a much increased list of stuff. Uh, this is Safari, uh, Command L, Command T, Command Shift, and there's tons of them here. Looks like more than twenty. So that's that's exciting. Fonts we mentioned, the new Files app we mentioned, um, the support for uh, uh, Microsoft's networking is. I presume it'll also support Apple's uh, networking. I mean, I think Apple's networking these days is yeah. uh, is, is SMB. <laughs> yeah. yeah, is it really? They, there's no what is it? They, oh, well, that's interesting. They, I think I, Apple shares been gone for a little. Oh, has while. it? Oh, all right. Okay. Will it work with PhoneNet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Safari now has a download manager. Really, what they've done is they've made Safari on the iPad desktop Safari. So. So the features mm. that you like in Safari on the desktop are now here. That that's that was weird language uh, that I, I've I haven't spent much time looking at what the new features of Safari are. But I thought that the entire the, the even when they introduced the iPad, they said, "Oh, we'll, we'll give you a desktop uh, desktop style browsing experience." I don't know how, what distinction they're making between this and uh, what they've been promising before. Well, I can tell you one thing because we use Google Docs a lot. Uh, iPad well, has yeah. historically done terrible with Google Docs. And it's fact, Google Docs' fault, yeah. Yeah, they specifically call out uh, Google Docs, Squarespace, and WordPress uh, web apps saying you'll be able to uh, use them now in Safari. Now, look at the size Look at the size of those uh, touch <laughs> touch targets in Google Docs, and you'll say, well, maybe I can use it, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to use the pencil to tap those uh, buttons. Uh, but, it, but at least it'll work, which is a huge uh, Im improvement. All right, why is everybody so excited about dark mode? I thought Adam Engst did a great article about why dark, dark mode is bad for you. We're not evolved to use dark mode. Are you a dark mode fan, James Thompson? <laughs> um, I use dark mode in certain apps at night. Generally, if I'm lying in bed trying mm -hmm. to read Twitter or something yep. like that, I don't want my retinas burnt out by the, the standard uh, interface. And... During the day, I tend not to. So, you know, I don't like on my Mac, 
on on my Mac using like Xcode or something like that. I tried it in dark mode for a while, and me I too. just it couldn't do it. It doesn't really work for no. me like that. Yeah. Um, but I I think there's a use case for it. I mean, I think there's obviously. Um, all of these things, it's accessibility features in some way, you know, and being able to use a phone without uh, blinding yourself is certainly counts. <laughs> uh, and it, it's, you know, it's just more choice, I think. Do you use you know, the default? I, I don't see. The... Uh-oh. Do you use the default Do Xcode light theme? Uh, yeah, I mean, like. Wow. The, Xcode uh, just. <laughs> I I like solarized themes, things like that. I like a little a little bit of color in my. <laughs> it's got some color, but you know I, I'm 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 focused on the the, the uh, oh, code yeah. in my head coding. or something like okay. that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. How about you, uh, Jim? Do you, are you an, a dark mode? You feel like it feels like to me you'd be a dark mode kind of guy. You know, you know what's funny is that <clears throat> when dark mode on. Mojave came out, I thought, ah, this isn't really something for me. I I like my Mac the way it is, and that's how I'm going to use it. And then when I installed Mojave, I, I, I think at the beginning you get an option to just set it to dark mode by default, so I did. I haven't switched it off. Oh, interesting. That's the <laughs> way it's been. I, I don't think I've seen Mojave in in normal mode. Interesting. <laughs> so I surprised myself with that one. Now, I, as I as I think about it, I I do think that there are times when normal mode or light mode would be better, especially when I'm outside and I'm working or or things like that. Dark mode sometimes gets a bit uh, tricky to see, but you know I I've I've been a fan of dark mode. Nice. And of course, it makes sense on uh, OLED screens like the iPhone XS and XS Max because it saves yeah. battery. You don't have to light up uh, dark pixels on those phones. I kind of I, I tried dark mode on the Mac for a while and went back to light mode. On the other hand, uh, in terminal modes, I always use dark modes. And uh, yeah, yeah. So who knows? I guess uh, different strokes for different folks. Uh, Gardner in our chat room says Monotype has issued a statement about fonts. In addition to new font licenses, users will be able to sync fonts they've already licensed from Monotype's e-commerce channel to their device. That's so awesome. If you've already bought fonts, and a lot of us have, uh, you'll have access. It sounds like, at least if they're Monotype, and I imagine if Monotype does it, everybody else will do it. So you can get your personal Helvetica oh. back. <laughs> um, all right, let's take a little break. It's great to have all three of you here. James Thompson is the creator of PCalc which is legendary. You said, what, how long have you been doing that? 18 years, you said? 27. 27? <laughs> yeah. Is the Mac even Math that old? does not go out of style. <laughs> wow. <laughs> which, which, version, which, which Mac did you write it for originally? Uh, it was originally a Mac Classic that I wrote it on. <gasps> wow. And were you, you were still in school? <laughs> I wish I was at university. <laughs> university. Well, that's, that's a school of kind. Of a kind, yeah. Uh, I, I'm possibly older than I seem. If you did it on the Mac Classic, <laughs> did you write it in Pascal? I did indeed. Which <sighs> is why the Panda mascot for Peacock oh, is called Pascal. Uh, oh, I'm learning something here. That's awesome. I remember when Think C came out. That was such an exciting moment. But I, I do yeah. still miss MPW. That was the was that what you were using? Probably was right. No, I uh, I was using Turbo uh, Pascal or Think Turbo pa Pascal and Think Pascal, Think Pascal. and then yeah. uh, I moved to try to think if I actually used Think C or just went straight to MetroWorks. MetroWorks, there was a great compiler. <laughs> yeah, those were all so amazing because they were so fast. It was just mm -hmm. wow. It's it's done. I didn't even have a chance to get a cup of coffee. Andy Yanako also here from the uh, Boston Public Radio, WGBH in Boston. And he's in the Boston Public Library right now, or some public library. I am in part of the wonderful Metro Public Library system. Very nice. Taking advantage of tax dollars at work. Well, th thank you, taxpayers. Thank you, <laughs> Massachusetts taxpayers. Jim Dalrymple, who just can't wait to get back. What are you going to do this afternoon? You're going to go over there. Is there any? Uh, are there any particular breakouts or sessions you want to go to? 
I have a few meetings over at uh, oh, good. at the convention today with developers, and then at five o'clock, um, I'm getting together with oh, just kind of an open, um, you know, people can come talk. I'm going to go to a bar and and uh, you know have some. Do you want to tell people which bar for, you're going to be at so we can? Oh, sit? it's it's the the Continental Bar. It's about a block <laughs> from uh, the convention center. Nice and. Um, you know, so, go up there and and have a few beer. And, say hi to the beer and the beard. Yep. Nice. It's no chieftain, though. <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, he knows the bars. <laughs> <laughs> the, the chieftain was my bar in San Francisco. Ah, uh, love think, that place. I think you two might have tipped a few there at one time. Could be. Ooh, may well. <laughs> <laughs> Our show today brought to you by Cap Terra. If you are using antiquated business software. That seems to be the state of the... When, when Microsoft said, <laughs> this cracked me up, uh, their new uh, browser, Edge, based on Chromium, one of the great new features of Edge will be you can run Internet Explorer in a window. <laughs> I knew exactly who that was for. There are people out there who are running line of business software that requires IE8 or active desktop. Uh, and it's because... Frankly, business software just doesn't get updated, does it? Well, good news. There is great business software out there just for you. Modern business software, on-premises software, web-based software, just for your particular business. And you can find it at Capterra.com. Capterra is software selection simplified. If you go there right now, you'll see over 700 categories of business software. All the big ones, CMS, email marketing, SEO, IT service, workflow management. We're looking at CRM programs right now. That's a great place to start. But even if you have a yoga studio or a veterinary office or a dentist's office, no matter what your business, Capterra has the solutions. Thousands of programs. Pick the program you need. Narrow it down by applying filters, product rating, the number of users it supports, deployment style, features. Get the ones you want, compare them side by side up to four at a time. They'll even show you a list of related categories for further options. But I think the killer feature on Capterra is the reviews. Over, they're getting close to a million reviews now, over 900,000 reviews of products. There's a thousand new reviews every single day by actual users. They're very careful to verify every single review. So you're going to get the information you need from people actually using that software to know whether it's the right software for you. A better program is waiting for you for your business and the best place to find it is capterra.com and here's the best part it's free there's no charge not freemium it's absolutely free c-a-p-t-e-r-r-a capterra.com slash mac break find the software you need check it out get the reviews no cost to you Stop Googling for the program you're looking for. Go to capterra.com slash MacBreak. I know you could go to capterra.com, but please go to capterra.com slash MacBreak. That way they know that you saw it here, and that helps us a lot. And we thank you, Capterra, for uh, your continued support of MacBreak Weekly. Capterra is software selection simplified. Capterra.com slash MacBreak. Yes, they spent time on Memojis. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I wanted a long well, beard emoji. <laughs> yeah. There is God. there are AirPods now. There's smoky eyeshadow. There's uh, Where's the beard? Actually, <laughs> where's the beard? Why no beard? In fact, are, are you telling me Jim if that you do the whole emoji thing and it takes a picture of you that you, it's a beardless Jim Dalrymple? That's uh, shocking. Well, there, there's no long beard in there. That's just shocking. We got to fix that. That's terrible. I How mean, it's barely, you... look, it's not even on all, all on the screen. <laughs> I know, it's so long it can't actually fit. That may be the, the reason. You, That's you right. need you, one you, of those you... uh, 6K screens and turn it sideways. Yeah, right. It was interesting. No, they you... brought two YouTube makeup stars on to demo the Memojis. <laughs> <laughs> now don't giggle don't giggle no, I, I think that I'm not is, laughing, I think it's I'm good i think it's good it's reaching out to women right i think it's like yeah making the whole thing not just about people who look like us right uh but uh 
you know, doing that and, and, you know, things like all the piercings and stuff, allowing people to customize. Oh, no, 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 no I'm sorry. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't the presence of piercings and makeup. It was like, oh, no, Instagram influencers on the. I, I, I remember when Tony Bennett was on that stage, <laughs> young man. Oh, you are an old timer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's when, not when the, when the nicer, it is not. <laughs> yeah. But 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 speaking of representation, is that is it brand new that you can uh, add a hijab? You can add uh, uh, like a, a sheet tur. They, a, they a, started a doing turban. that in emojis, but I'm glad to see that. Yeah, you can right. do that in emojis, and emojis. as yeah. well as uh, gaps in your teeth, missing teeth, gold teeth, braces, uh, facial and ear piercings, hats, glasses, even AirPods. Um, this and the fact that you can now uh, uh, track your cycle on the Apple Watch is shows that it isn't a male-dominated uh, world anymore, and I think that that's a that's a good thing. Yeah, I think it's a step in the right direction. It's I think it there. probably We're still is, bit by bit, bit right. by bit. Right. I, I didn't see a lot of women in the audience, although I think there are more female developers now than ever before. I hope so. Anyway. Yeah. But that, that's part that's particularly uh, an important thing for Apple to be able to promote. Not uh, all these health features that are. Uh, if Apple is going to dunk on any everybody about privacy, the ability to benefit from health tracking and making sure that that is not being harvested and sold to third parties, that is one of the hugest reasons to get an Apple Watch. On top of all the all the technical reasons, just, just over the weekend, I was considering buying a Bluetooth enabled. Uh, blood pressure cuff because I'm taking a, I'm taking a brain pill that you, know, you might want to take a look at your blood pressure for I have no blood pressure problems but I instantly like said no I, looking at all the privacy policies where all it, all I want is one that will not I don't have to sign up for an app and I don't have to agree to some licensing agreement that says that we will share information with other people yeah. and it's like nope I don't <laughs> I don't medically I don't need this and so therefore I don't want this I gave up on privacy so long ago I actually tweet my blood pressure now automatically <laughs> my blood pressure gets tweeted just saying uh there we're in a new world leo <laughs> <laughs> I, what's what puzzles me is there's several thousand people following that twitter feed i don't know why anybody would care uh apple though did really double down on privacy this this uh apple i think now is making this part of their business model for instance ios 13 has a new feature i missed this slide but zach whitaker called it out on TechCrunch. You can limit app location access to just once. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, you can open up a Maps app and say, just this once, tell me where I am. Uh, that's The that's other great. thing, the, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth protection is very interesting because there's apps like, you know, Facebook, for example, that you don't realize are querying, you know, the Bluetooth devices and things you have connected and what Wi-Fi networks are around you and stuff like that. And if you install those apps now on, on the beta and you run it, you know, it says, do you want to let Facebook have access to these? No. Things? It's like, no, I really don't. <laughs> Facebook would like to know every IoT device in your home. Do you mind? No. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I yeah. mind. Um, and new and, and new home kit security for cameras to make that even more secure. Yeah, now I have uh, to wonder how many uh, camera companies are going to sign up. They mentioned three, um, Anchors, Eufy, uh, Logitech, and NetAtmo. But you know Google and their Nest cameras, there's no way in the world they're going to sign up for, for that. Because partly because these cameras make money with a monthly subscription. Apple's offering, uh, what was it, 10 days of recordings free. Yeah, but, there, but that's such a good thing to sell your camera on that those who, those of you who use Apple products that care about privacy, uh, if you if you if try to compare try to compete with Nest, uh, you're not going to have a good time of it. Try to compete with all these like twenty dollar cameras good that point. are Amazon deals of the day. You're not going to have a good time of it. But if you're saying that we are the most we we believe we believe in Apple's privacy right. uh, system, and so therefore we are one of a handful of cameras that cares more about you, the customer. Than about harvesting yeah. data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we also make cameras that will harvest your data. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. you have the choice. Or, yeah. or, or if or if you're if you're really down with that, that would be awesome. It's, but not I mean, it's not it's it. not merely harvesting the data. I mean, these cameras make money on the monthly subscriptions. I spent a lot right. of money on Nest subscriptions, and that would cut those that uh, ancillary uh, income out for those cameras. Although there are companies like Wise who've come along to be YZE uh, who is, you know give you this without a subscription fee and the cameras are 20 bucks, 10 bucks, whatever, 30 bucks. 
Um, so maybe there is a, a, a little competition going on in this. The other thing Apple announced that I wonder how many people will sign up for is sing, a new single sign-on. So sign-on. So if you've seen, you know, sign up with Twitter. Do you, James? Do you do that with a PCALC? Do you use sign up no, with Google, that, Facebook, Twitter? No, the, you, there's no need for an account because you oh, know okay. I don't. You don't okay. keep any. I don't keep any information. It's it's a lot easier to not have any privacy problems if you don't keep any <laughs> yeah. information. I don't know, and um, I don't want to. Yeah. But uh, what I think is very interesting about this is if you use any of these, like, you know, sign on with Google and sign on with Facebook in your app, you uh, have to include the sign on with Apple. They're making it mandatory if you use any of these 3D oh, uh, th that's third party sign on things. So oh. that is going to. Uh, <laughs> a lot of these features seem designed to thwart the ad tracking companies uh and uh, i'm all for it I, I love the yeah. you know the i don't want to give them my email address so give them this uh random string of numbers as an email address and that will eventually get to me but i can switch it off and they don't actually have my real email address so, so all that stuff looks really good this is how apple gets people to use it they require yeah. it. yes but, but by using the the big uh um bat that they can hit the developers yeah. with. I, say, I, I always avoid this. single sign-on because, well, it, it became an issue for me when I killed my Facebook account and I had a lot of stuff <laughs> and I couldn't <laughs> sign into it anymore. So uh, that gave, you know, taught me the lesson, use your email uh, to do this. But I think a lot of, I mean, most people who have Apple IDs are probably going to keep their Apple ID for some time. And uh, the idea that you can use an email that's hidden is probably very attractive. Yeah, I'm I'm keen to see how that works because sometimes um, I don't I, I want to actually have access to certain stores that do they annoy me by sending me an email every day but once out of the month there will be a special offer code right. for something I actually need. Well, still the email uh, still and, goes to you. Apple forwards it. Yeah, to you. but but what I'm what I'm interested in is can you does it have to go to the email that's associated with your Apple ID ah. or can you can I create a burner address on uh, on Gmail or something for like just <laughs> offers. Andy's offers at whatever.com. Right. So, uh, so burners on top of burners. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm behind seven proxies. Try to find me. <laughs> uh, sign in with Apple makes it easy for users to authenticate with face ID or touch ID. That also is, is yeah. great instead of a password and has two factor authentication built in for a added layer of security. So that is, Great, but it does not require iOS or a Mac OS to use it. Uh, yeah. But I guess you have to have an Apple ID. Otherwise, yeah. you, you can't use it. So that uh, I, th I think this is smart. Apple's really doubling down. They're becoming the privacy company. Uh, Google fired are, back yeah. at their developer conference, but as Sundar Pichai said, does, that privacy shouldn't be a luxury item. Um, but Google's not exactly known for privacy, so <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that applies. It um, doesn't. Well, it doesn't. <laughs> that, well, yeah. That's Jim's answer. I mean, Google, okay, I Google has other well, ways well, of handling this, but yeah, I mean, both both companies like every time they do, go and do an absolute like that, I'm like, oh dear, don't 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 yeah. don't fight with Apple over privacy. I yeah. I do Google. I, I I know that you do the best you possibly can, and you care about it up to the point where it affects business. And Apple, I know that you like to say, hey, we are completely private, except for all the apps that you <laughs> download and use, and expect except for the websites you visit. But other than that, completely private. Like just let's just agree that Apple is better than Google at this, and but both have room for improvement. Yeah. There uh, were other restrictions, I believe, on tracking stuff in apps used by kids and things good, like yeah. that. So, yeah, Apple announced um, today that they are going to allow the uh, kid, the uh, the screen time utilities that they had previously blocked from using MDM. Uh, they're going to allow them to do it uh, as long as they don't send details about uh, the user back to their servers. Um, so, mm -hmm. companies that are offering these yeah. uh, parental control features will now be able to go back to using. Uh, those yeah. MDM certificates. There, there are a lot of cool tidbits in there. Like they finally added uh, just a a, a caller a, a spam call blocker where as, if an incoming call number is not in your in your contacts database anywhere, it will just automatically kick it to voicemail. Simplest thing ever, but it just is such a complete solution to annoyances. There is a nice feature on Google's uh, Pixel phones where you can do you know you can press a button that says send that you know 
<laughs> get to screen this guy. I don't want to know if I don't, yeah. I don't think he's real. But uh, you know, and of course, a lot of carriers are now offering features like that: some free, some paid. Uh, but it, for Apple to do it is probably pretty important. So the carriers sell your numbers to uh, yeah to telemarketers, <laughs> yeah, and then they charge you yeah. to screen to block it yeah. the telemarketers. Yeah. It's brilliant. It's a profit deal. I think. Yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Photos has been updated. I didn't see anything, you know, crazy exciting, except perhaps the fact that the, all the tools that you use in still photos can now be used on videos, uh, including rotating the video. Yeah. <laughs> that was in QuickTime years ago, I remember. I used it a lot, uh, but you had to have QuickTime Pro. So this is, that's good. I think there are a lot of people with a video that needs to be rotated or fixed. <laughs> Any of the filters that you have uh, in photos can also be used on uh, on video, which is pretty neat. Yeah, and that, that, I think they're also the other thing that kind of caught my eye. They they're adding a lot of really nice sort of like finer grained editing tools uh, to uh, the to the photos app. One of them is noise reduction and. Cool. Keen to see how well that works. I know that uh, iPhones already do a huge amount of like really effective noise reduction before they even write the file. Uh, but the ability to just uh, uh, re reduce like color noise uh, is just such a big, big deal. Particularly when the weak the they uh, the iPhones still have a weakness with low light video, they haven't really come up with a really really great solution to that yet. But hey, if, it, if if that's one of the bag of tricks you can do when you tap on just auto fix this, uh, that's going to make a lot of people really happy. Speaking of privacy, I've just learned. Uh, thank you, Scooter X, in our chat room. Tim Cook will be on the CBS Evening News tonight from WWDC. Here's the little clip that they posted uh, about from that interview about privacy. Can you hear and it? That new innovation of that Apple sign-on, I thought, this is Apple taking a shot at the way Facebook and Google is using all of our data. You know, we're not really taking a shot at anybody. We, we, we focus <laughs> on the user. And the user wants the ability to go across numerous properties on the web without being uh, under surveillance. We're, we're moving privacy uh, protections forward. And I, I actually think it's a, v a very reasonable request for people to make. Do you think Facebook cares about our private security? I, I think that everybody's beginning to care more. People are becoming very more diplomatic. Aware of what's that been was happening. super diplomatic. And many people are getting more offended. I think this is good. Thank goodness he wasn't drinking uh, or taking a sip of water when that question came. You can imagine an environment where everyone begins to think there's no privacy. And if there's no privacy, your freedom of expression just plummets. Yeah, because point. now you're going to be thinking about that everybody's going to know every single thing you're doing. This is not good for our country, not good for democracy. I agree. I agree. Uh, that's uh, CBS Evening News' Nora O'Donnell, the anchor interviewing Tim Cook. It'll appear on uh, the news tonight on CBS, the full interview. Um, so, yeah, Tim is Tim is the ultimate diplomat, but he can let the product speak for themselves, I yep. guess. Um, oh, I had a question for you. Uh, let's see, James. Oh, performance. They weirdly began the ios segment by talking about how much faster the new ios would be which puzzled well, me a little bit i mean they did that last year as well they had a big focus on performance that's why it puzzled me it's like but didn't you just well, make I it think faster they're saying, they're saying like you know we got better we we did even more yeah. i mean it, it's it's I, just for hearing that, like Face ID was thirty percent faster or something, I thought, well, you know, that that affects me. I unlock my phone a lot, so you know, this is good. Do you know how they're making apps launch twice as fast and be smaller in size? Is there a, um, a new format? I don't think there's a new format. I mean, I think some of the space savings are then not downloading as much as they need as they previously did, um, so they're thinning out the apps. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on, okay. on the details on that. How they make the stuff launch faster is just there's a lot of extremely clever people who yeah. sit there for a long time working out how to shave a couple of milliseconds off some uh, system call. Uh, okay. So, wow. that's It's impressive because it, it, it is the same processor. It's the same, you know, storage speed. So it's all, yeah. it's all being done by uh, better code, I guess. Yeah, better code. And like once you can make the compiler generate better code, then, you know, the 
the the benefits like trickle down to everyone like when we recompile our apps we'll get faster stuff as well siri has a new voice did you like siri's new voice this sounded really good that's yeah. the best text to speech i've heard let me, let me play and, let me play a little bit what they did is they had siri read a very turgid uh scientific description <laughs> uh, from I guess from Wikipedia Absolute and then zero is the lowest limit of the thermodynamic temperature scale a state at which the enthalpy and entropy of a cooled ideal gas reach their minimum value taken as zero that's the old Siri all right so that's okay but now let's try <laughs> iOS 13 with neural text-to-speech absolute zero is the lowest limit of the thermodynamic temperature scale a state at which the enthalpy and entropy of a cooled ideal gas reach their minimum value, taken as zero. That's impressive. Way still not intelligible, but... I still, I still, I still can understand it, yeah. <laughs> still baffling. <laughs> I understood the words, if not the, yeah. what it actually meant. But, They're doing... This is uh, something Google does as well, which is take the uh, generated text and then apply a human cadence and phrasing uh, to it. They Google has a term for it, which I've forgotten. Uh, but But... By applying that, then they can get it to sound much more natural, and it does. It sounds very yeah. good. The, the the basic idea is that instead of taking uh, pre 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 cooked waveforms and sticking them together to produce a speech, they're basically synthesizing the entire waveform from start to finish, and this just the difference is just immediate. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how parallel the developments are at Google and Apple, just down the road a bit. Uh, many oh, of the things was, they showed really are, are very similar to what Google's been showing. Well, that, that's because everybody who's doing research in AI, they, they want to publish. They right. want to be able to discuss their their advances with other people. So this is one place where, to an extent, everybody's sort of building the same uh, features and improvements for every platform out there. So, yeah. Jim, did you get that nice coat, the jacket, the WWDC <laughs> jacket? Yes. That is a... Reversible. I love the inside. The lining is so cool. Yeah. So half of the people were wearing them inside out and, yeah. and <laughs> half were wearing them regular. Oh, we have a, a visitor in the studio. You got the orange one, eh? This is the lining, which is which is <coughs> from the invitation to uh, the uh, event, WWDC. It's a very subtle jacket on the uh, outside. It's just, in fact, you can barely read the WWDC. Are you going to wear it inside or outside? I think you should wear the orange. <laughs> that is that is that is beautiful. That makes me want to go to WWDC now. James, do you wish you'd gone? <laughs> that is a beautiful jacket. I uh, feel like I, I could still like save a lot of money by buying that on eBay. Oh They're yeah, just just with just with airfare alone. Uh, yeah, not as much as you'd think. Those things go for quite a bit. Uh, true, <laughs> it's a premium premium product. Uh, let's see, Maps. It sounds like I, a lot of people interpreted it that Apple is now driving around all over the United States creating LiDAR maps of the U.S. They did mention the word LiDAR. Mm. So they've got Street View. Okay, Google's had that for some time. But what are they using the LiDAR for? More detailed uh, maps. Yeah, or preparing for self-driving vehicles. Maybe. That too, but a lot of the lidar is just used to identify uh, features of the features of a certain block that will help you target images that you can pull information from. So if you know that that's not just a that's not just a poster, that's actually a door. You can actually look at that door to find to look for uh, an address marker. Or if you're going around and you're trying to find out, this is definitely the right address, but I don't. This is one of those big buildings. I don't know where the entrance is. If you're just looking at a flat image, that's a small bit of information to call, to call from. But if you've got LiDAR, you can figure out exactly that looks like a door. Let's examine that for more data. <sighs> you're just ruining my, completely ruining my conspiracy theory. <laughs> they did or, show or, off the or, ability or, that's... The, if, you know, Leo, Leo, if I were under NDA on Apple's oh, non-driving car project, I would certainly not talk, talk uh, about that, would I? Well, we've not... You know, the truth is we've seen these cars ride around and people have identified... In fact, I, I just saw an article from Leander Connie from three years ago where he said, that's LiDAR on those Apple Maps yeah. vans. Um, and they did have that one feature that Street View doesn't have. I, it was kind of blew me away that the presenter showed us going up, uh, you know, through Chinatown in San Francisco, like, Google's done this for years. What do you mean? <laughs> but 
she did then turn and you could get information about the store. It was highlighted right on the store. So that maybe that's what the lighter yeah. is being used for. That was pretty cool. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of really great features there that I, th I think the point is that there, it's not that uh, Apple Maps has to be absolutely 100% as good as Google Maps, but it just needs to adapt a bunch of features like Street View, like having really in-depth information about what is here block to block to block to get people to dip into Google Maps less frequently. It really is the one one of the few Google apps that you is kind of a must have on any uh, Apple device. And if they just simply make Apple Maps a little bit better, uh, then they can just simply get people to put off downloading it enough times they'll forget they ever needed it. So it's really cool stuff going on there. And the images do look a lot better. They showed a side by side. Apple's also updating its CarPlay to uh, compete, I think, a little bit better with Android Auto. Uh, CarPlay in the past has just been a grid of icons, uh, but now they have a little bit more information on the screen, even while you're looking at maps and other things. Uh, that's, I think, a good thing. CarPlay is now, according to Renee Ritchie, in 90% of cars sold in the U.S. So that's pretty impressive. And Pandora and Waze are now part of CarPlay. A page they took from Spotify, the ability to uh, audio share with AirPods. <laughs> So <laughs> two pairs of AirPods can pair to one iPad and hand off to a HomePod. That was the Spotify feature. I think you walk through the door, hold your iPad close to your HomePod, and it'll start playing the music you've been listening to on your phone or a tablet. Anything else people, you guys are excited about? Well, one thing I'll tell you right now, James Thompson, that plan that you had to do a, a, a better reminders app than Apple, you might as well just forget that. <laughs> That's... They've completely rewritten Reminders from scratch, and it looks fantastic. It looks a little like Google Keep, actually, but um, Siri, Siri suggestions in there and all of that. Yeah, James, is there anything that you've seen uh, at WWDC that we didn't mention that you thought would be uh, important to... I mean, the, from a developer perspective, the biggest thing that they announced was the Swift UI framework yeah, boy, because that cool. that's, that's basically... That's what we're going to be using probably in five to ten years. Yep. You know, they they basically turned around and said, you know, all that code you've written, forget well, it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I mean, the, the, they have done it in such a way that you can sort of uh, start adopting it. It slowly. makes me but, want to uh, learn Swift. I have to say, well, put me out of a job. No, I won't put you out of a job. I the, the best calculator in the world is already available. There's no reason to, <laughs> to write another one. It's uh, peak calc. Uh, I, I actually was really impressed by the mocap that they were doing. Yeah, there was a lot of that AR stuff. I mean, yeah. again, it's the the strange level of investment in AR through a phone screen that doesn't entirely make sense. Uh, so, you know, the, there's clearly Apple is building to something. Yeah. And... Uh, I look forward to AR when it's not somebody holding up a phone. Because yes, yes. Yeah. That, that's no, not what I want to do. It's clear with but, both Apple's and Apple's and Google stuff that they are building out all the software so that if and when they develop some sort of a camera device that you can wear without feeling like a dork, uh, everything else will be ready to just install on it. They were yeah. doing some really amazing stuff, though, with the, the ability to walk around among AR devices. The occlusion works better. Everything works a lot better. And yeah. I yeah. think a testament to how well it works that they're starting to move this down to uh, A9 processors, uh, so older iPhones without those special cameras. That's, uh, that's big. Jim Dalrymple, anything you think we should talk about that we didn't mention uh, from WWDC? You know, I, I think we covered um, all of the the important stuff that happened. But I think what everybody needs to realize is that the stuff we talked about is just barely scratching the surface. I think so, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. There, there was so much announced uh, or so much in these uh, releases that they couldn't even get to. Yeah. Uh, and And... You know, for developers like James, they they look far deeper than what we do when we uh, take a look at these these releases. We take a look at the big features. They go into the APIs and the code, and they figure out what new apps they're going to build. And, and this is what pushes the developer community forward and what pushes Apple forward. And that's the important part that comes out of WDC, I think. So... Well, it's it's very interesting for us to sit back and look at at these features, but 
man, the stuff that didn't even get talked about is is what's going to drive the company. Yeah. Plus, remember that yeah. this is uh, I, uh, the new version of iOS, the new version of macOS, the new version of iPadOS. They're not coming out until September. This is just the stuff that they were able to show us right now. So we yeah. got a lot of surprises waiting for us. Uh, Andy, I have found the WWDC 2019 limited edition reversible jacket. Uh, if you want red, it'll set you back nine hundred dollars. <laughs> Blue is a thousand dollars. That doesn't want it to stand right there. Yeah. Well, they, they got they got to make their money back somehow. If I <laughs> somebody's selling uh, his black and black for only one hundred forty nine dollars, I wonder can that? Oh wait a minute, it's just gone up to six hundred fifty. That was a. That was, I'll, I'll, that was the I'll, bid. I'll, <laughs> that was the minimum I'll make, bid. I'll make, I'll make an offer. I'll, I'll, I'll trade a package of unopened Game of Thrones Oreos for one. <laughs> ooh, ooh, well, <laughs> Another uh, really limited collectible. <laughs> um, all right. I know Jim Dalrymple wants to get back to uh, WWDC. So let's get the uh, <laughs> let's get the picks of the week in just a moment. Gentlemen, it's great to have you here. It's uh, We couldn't uh, pick a better team to do coverage of <laughs> WWDC than James Thompson of PCALC fame. If you don't have PCALC on your Apple Watch, on your iPhone, on your iPad, on your Mac, why not? Get it now. <laughs> uh, Jim Dalrymple, loopinsight.com. No need to fear the beard. It's <laughs> But we do want it in a memoji. And from uh, Boston yes. Public Radio, Andy and Notco. I think there should be. Uh, I think I think mutton chops might also be a nice memoji feature. I, I, and they and you know if they got coverage, they can say that. Oh no, it's a uh, it's it's for uh, science fiction author sort of. <laughs> yeah, memoji. it's they, the Asimov. They don't have to say it's about yeah. me, but I'll, I'll take it anyway. <laughs> I think it'd be really nice to have a slider. That's a facial hair slider that you slide down, and the beard just kind of slowly grows <laughs> down your face and down your chest, and then that's him, gonna... officer. That's the one who's broken <laughs> my shed. It's that one. <laughs> Our show today brought to you in a perfect time for it by Calm dot Calm. Calm is the best app for relaxing, for for enjoying for reducing stress in your life, for helping you sleep. One in three U.S. adults, one in three, this seems low, doesn't get enough sleep. I, I should count for four or five of those. If you're not sleeping enough, you don't think well, you don't learn well, you don't make good decisions. You should make a good decision right now and download Calm, the number one app for sleep. Not only the sleep stories, but meditation, the daily meditations, which will help you relax. The sleep stories by people like Stephen Fry and Matthew McConaughey, uh, Jerome Flynn, the sellsword from Game of Thrones. He's got one about New Zealand that I just love. It was so great. You'll discover a whole library of programs designed to help you get sleep, the sleep your brain and body needs, soundscapes too, like calm lakes and rainstorms. The guided meditations are fantastic. Seize the day, sleep the night. With the help of Calm. Right now you can get Calm Premium with everything you see here. For tw It was the Apple app of the year, by the way, of 2017. For 25% off when you go to calm.com slash MacBreak. C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash MacBreak. Moby released his most recent album exclusively on Calm. It's some beautiful meditative music. Uh, I know a lot of coders like to listen to lyric-free music. Uh, while they're while they're focusing while they're working, Calm has it all. Calm.com/slash/MacBreak. Twenty-five percent off your subscription. Forty million people have downloaded Calm. Maybe you should make it forty million in one. C A L M dot com slash MacBreak. We thank them so much for their support and for keeping me calm. Do you ever listen to music, James, while you're uh, coding? Yeah, and it's exactly that. I, yeah. I prefer stuff with no lyrics, so I've got. Like lots of instrumental playlists yes. of of stuff. I remember, and reading... I can't, li I can't listen to podcasts at all. No, no, it's distracting. Or just... books? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's too distracting. Yeah. I remember uh, reading that Baroque music was particularly good for focus, but I think a lot of the kind of smooth stuff that they have on Calm is also very good. The other thing is listen to lots of stuff with lyrics that aren't in English because yeah. uh, it doesn't engage the language centers in your <laughs> right, brain. Right. So. Yeah, lots of J-pop and K-pop and whatever else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
James, is there anything you'd like to pick besides PCALC as a pick of the week? Um, I, I don't think it would be fair to pick my own app for this. <laughs> uh, so I would like to focus on some of the other apps that got Sherlocked. Oh. Um, so we, we talked about uh, the lunar display and duet and things, but I'd like to focus on uh, Vignette by Casey Liss which adds uh, photos <laughs> to your contact. Casey released uh, that 20 minutes ago. I don't understand how they could have <laughs> Sherlocked him so fast. I think it was clearly they were both working on things in parallel. And oh. It was not targeted specifically at Casey. Oh. But still, it's a good app. I've, I installed it. I happily paid my money. And you can try it and see how many of the pictures it gets for your contacts without paying anything. And then if you want to copy all the pictures over, then then you have to give him some of his hard-earned money. I'm going to buy Vignette just to support Casey. That's just, I mean, good Lord. Anyway. <laughs> That's a very good point. CaseyList.com if you want to read about Vignette. C-A-S-E-Y-L-I-S-S. -S. Released May 22nd. Sherlock June 3rd. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I PayPal him a hug? Oh. <laughs> I'd like to do that. Uh, you know, it's a brilliant idea. It's just, yeah, you can see that Apple didn't, you know, take it from him. They wouldn't have. And I think it does still do things that Apple stuff doesn't yeah, it do because it's, it's pulling in stuff off Gravatar and all this. Yeah, it's, it starts, it, it's a nice. It starts with Gravatar. Nice it's got Twitter. It's got everything. It's Facebook. It's got Instagram. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is a better way to do it. Do it with do it with vignette. Although, honestly, you could get a better picture of Christina Warren. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, Jim Dalrymple. You got some rock and roll for us today? You know what? <clears throat> I learned from, from the last time that I was on the show that people really enjoyed taking a step back. You mentioned Metallica and, last time, which was so uh, much AC -DC. fun. ACDC. Or ACDC, that's right, yeah. So for the party that I had at WWDC last night, I had to build a playlist for when the band wasn't on. Oh. And what I decided to do was... Uh, build a playlist that, as it turned out, there was only one song that was released after 1980 or 81. <laughs> so uh, what I really uh, enjoyed about that playlist is going back and listening to some of, of the great legendary bands. So today, the Rolling Stones. Yeah. But... The Rolling Stones from like uh, mid to late '60s, the maybe early, early '70s, yeah. at 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 the most. And uh, you know, two of the songs that I had on there were um, "Get Off of My Cloud," yep, which is one hey, of my favorite all time Stone songs, and "Give Me Shelter." Yeah, you know, I to me that really shows some songwriting that. Um, was magnificent. The the musicianship, the songwriting, everything in there was just su such a high level. I loved it. So I actually, I, I had to kick out songs that, you know, I, I, I had, you know, a few hours of music and I only needed 30 minutes. So <laughs> uh, there was a lot of great stuff in there. That so must be a fun to man. me that, that kind of, that kind of, Touched me last week, so yeah. that must be a fun thing to do. Actually, I never thought about that. We, I'm the loop bash was last night. Sorry if you missed it, but yes. uh, I'm sure it was a fantastic party as it is every year. It, it, it was, yeah, yeah. And look, I'm for, glad your pick of the. I'm glad your pick of the week isn't a bail bondsman. <laughs> 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 and you know, if you're ever in trouble in San Jose, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we should mention uh, Jim is going to be at a bar again tonight. Um, yes. What was the name of it again? Continental. Continental, in uh, just down the road from the McHenry. If you want to say hi to the beard, thank you for being here, Jim. I really appreciate it. I know you're taking time off from some important yes. work. Sorry, I was late. No, but I think now that I realize you had your party last night, I understand. <laughs> 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 Have a great one, Jim. We really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, Andy Yanako. What do you got for us? Uh, mine is an easy one, uh, uh, honoring the great new files app for uh, for iPad OS that lets you just stick something into the USB port and suddenly mount it. Uh, this has been in my pocket since I bought it a couple months ago. It's SanDisk's Ultra Ooh. Dual Drive. 
Uh, and one end of it is a USB A, oh. and if you flick the switch the other way, you get a USB C. Oh. And so it's the and uh, simplest way possible to get something off of one device and put it onto a phone or put it onto something else. Uh, it's not ter not terribly expensive. I got the 256 gig model, so part of that means that my entire music library is about 100 gigs, 110 gigs. So I have that plus so much enough storage that I can have lots of movies I want to watch <laughs> lots of uh, lots of like backup files for pretty much anything my presentation for wherever I'm going will land on this and it's nice and compact it's so small that uh, so long as you don't have a minimalist wallet, I actually have this inside a little flap inside my wallet at all, t at, at all times. USB 3.0, of course, so it's super, super fast. Uh, and you can format it so that it's just Mac OS, of course. You can format it so that it'll work with pretty much any device you ever come across. So my pick of the week. I remember having Steve Wozniak on the old screensavers in the early 2000s, and he wore a USB drive around his neck. I think it was probably a gigabyte. I said, I have everything I need is on here. I always have it with me. So, I'm sure it cost a thousand dollars back in uh, yep. back in those days. We were all ooing. And, uh, that's a that's a gigabyte. Wow, that's amazing. Hey, I owe uh, Roberto uh, a uh, thank you, uh, Roberto Hoya Throw Boy, because he has a new line and he sent me everything from the new line. These are pillows, Throw Boy pillows. From the good old days, this they can't use the real name. So this is, and you'll just know what it is, 2007. I'll give you a hint. It has a headphone jack. <laughs> uh, I, I love this pillow. This is 1977. It's a, I don't know if it's an Apple II or two C. I don't know. Oh, my God. Look at I that. I used to fall asleep and drool on the real thing when I was a kid at late <laughs> night. Now much I can do it on a pillow. From 2001 <laughs> comes something that looks amazingly like the original iPod. And, yes, you can... <laughs> it has firewire sort of um th this is one of my favorites this thank you uh, this is yeah. so great look at the bondi blue sort of imac pillow 1998 what a year including that very expensive cd <laughs> steve wanted a slot but the team said no you can't have it <laughs> no but one of the few times steve didn't get what he wanted and this of course is going to ho go home with me this is uh, everybody's favorite from 1984. Why 1984 won't be like 1984. Go ahead. Try to throw a sledgehammer through it. Just try. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you to James and Jim and Andy. Uh, thanks to a great studio audience, great big studio audience of people who obviously were at WWDC. They got the jacket. Uh, if you want to be in our studio audience, email tickets at twit.tv. We'll make sure there's uh, room for you. And uh, if you want to watch live on the live stream, that's at twit.tv slash live. You can listen live there as well while you're listening or watching live. Join us in the chat room. A bunch of other people also doing the live thing at irc.twit.tv. All of our shows are available on demand from the website, twit.tv. In this case, twit.tv slash mbw. And you can also subscribe in your favorite podcast application. That way you'll get it instantly. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I did ask Alex Lindsay if he would buy the new Mac Pro. He can't be with us. He's busy right now. But he said, I'm buying as many as I can afford. <laughs> but I may have to take out a, a second mortgage. <laughs> I'm buying as many as I can afford, too. Zero. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. But now I'm sad to say it's time to get back to work because break time is over. Bye-bye. Oh,